I think it's really reasonable to think that core inflation could surprise people to the downside. You're seeing inflation expectations rise quite meaningfully across the globe. That acceleration that we've seen in wages, you'll probably see that showing up in prices. So we could actually accelerate in some components of inflation. What's very, very unique about this cycle is that recession risks and inflation risks are at odds with each other with respect to policy. We're on the cost or we're in a global recession as we speak. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. So scared of bears we came inside. That's not the truth. <laughs> the weather's absolutely abysmal outside. The team's been rallying through the night to bring us inside and bring a show to you. TK, still a big day. In clement us. weather here in Wyoming for Chairman Powell. This is going to be really, really interesting, John. What's interesting, I did an all-nighter, folks. There was such chaos here with the weather. I haven't had any sleep. And I noticed <laughs> about 2 a.m., there was Chairman Powell rewriting the speech. Would you like to talk about that all-nighter that you pulled last night? Or no, I, I, but I think that that's the tension. Here. This is not a normal Jackson Hole, and they're rewriting the speeches right now. It's not a normal Jackson Hole. And, Lisa, I think we've all got to look back to 12 months ago when Chairman Powell delivered a speech right here and reread that speech because I was rereading that speech in the last 24 hours and I have to say history hasn't been kind Lisa Trans to that speech. <laughs> Transitory has failed the idea of passing over inflation has not borne out in any way shape or form how do they reshape that how do they get ahead of that especially given the feeling that perhaps some of these inflationary aspects are stickier for a very protracted period of time. How do they reshape that? The narrative? team put it together some great articles this morning and throughout the day, no doubt, here at Bloomberg. This from Marcus Ashworth, Tom, of Bloomberg Opinion. Jackson Hole should be a central bank mea culpa. A central bank mea culpa. Uh, no, that's true. And Governor Bailey's going to show up to give his part of the mea me a call, but I think it's 2020 hindsight. It is valid this time around. There's some real questions there. I spoke last night to Jacob Frankel, the former governor of the Bank of Israel, and he was not scathing, as that's not the right word, but he's very cognizant that they have to reset here after a difficult 18 months. We've got to reset and talk about the price action this morning, and here it is for you. We are positive about a half of 1% on the S&P 500. In the bond market, I've got to say, the one thing that I looked at through the whole of yesterday was how close we came to 340 on a two-year yield, Bramo. Backing away this morning by a couple of basis points, but what <clears> were we, five, six basis points away from the year's highs on a two-year yield going into Chairman Powell with, tomorrow? With greater inversion and this expectation for hawkishness, and really, how does he deliver on that? Uh, and if he doesn't deliver on that, do you see a rally in markets, especially as they pull together? Uh, more significantly, this is day one of the Jackson Hole meeting. We are not inside because of the bear threat, although I will say that when I got to the airport, it did say you can rent bear spray you see. in a bear very big is this a change uh, sign. Of tune? Are we I'm on not. The same no. Page now? Uh, you know, there were, my taxi no, driver was speaking about okay. mauling hikers, etc. We have uh, an incredible roster of guests, including Seth Carpenter of Morgan Stanley, Esther George will be uh, speaking with her own Michael McKee, and Megan Green joining us here. We're also going to be getting initial jobless claims at 8:30. This, to me, is going to be really interesting because it's all about the jobs market at this point. How much do they speak about what kind of pain, what kind of unemployment rate uh, we have to see in order to achieve lower inflation? And today, Tom was skeptical to me that I was interested in Dollar Tree and some of the other retailers. But <laughs> there are a bunch of retailers that are oh. going to be reporting earnings, including Dollar Tree, Dollar General. Abercrombie & Fitch is not in the same kind of, sort of category, but also facing some of the retail uh, threats, as well as Ulta, Gap, Williams, Sonoma. The read on the consumer that we're getting from some of these retailers is fascinating and at a moment where we're really seeing some demand uh, destruction as a result of inflation. Is this Fed speaking, John? to the people that shop at Dollar Tree. That's the heart of the matter. I think that's a really important point. And um, when we catch up with Fed officials for the next 24 hours, I think that's a point we're going to bring up repeatedly. Let's start the coverage this morning. We can do that with Alan Ruskin, the chief international strategist at Deutsche Bank. And Alan, let's start right here. Chairman Powell tomorrow, what are you looking for? Well, I think we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. I think that's the, the, the starting point. I mean, he spoke about a month ago. I do think the Fed is going to push back on all this chatter about pivots. I think uh, the notion of a uh, hiking cycle that ends and turns into a rate cut cycle, uh, you know, by the second half of 2023, I think we've seen 
consistency from Fed officials that they don't really believe in that kind of cycle, that rates might well uh, remain at some sort of plateau for, for quite some time. And in general, I, I think they <clears throat> are going to push back to that thoughts of uh, anything like a peak in the Fed funds below what we've already got priced in at around three and uh, three quarter percent. Now, on the day of the invasion of Ukraine, we spoke to your colleague, David Folkerts Landau, and he was heated about the tumult that will come, particularly on fiscal policy. The litmus paper of that is the dollar. This is what you're expert at. Have you and George Cervellas adjusted the Deutsche Bank dollar call with this dollar strength that we see? I think what we're, we're what we've been doing, uh, Tom, is really uh, pushing out the thoughts in terms of dollar weakness and the broader idea that the dollar is not going to peak in a convincing way until there's greater resolution in terms of how Europe navigates its energy crisis through the winter. I think that's the first port of call. Uh, in general, the do dollar strength you're seeing is uh, in, no, in, in no small part related to uh, problems elsewhere. It's in Europe. China's obviously slowing. Japan's got its problems in terms of very low interest rates and very easy monetary policy. So the dollar by default, I think, will remain strong, uh, at least for the next few months. Oh, I like that. Alan, this goes to a point that you're writing a lot about that I find really compelling, which is the dollar is a safe haven and the potential squeeze inherent in that. And I take a look at not only interest rates, but also the fact that we could get a 2020-like move into the dollar. How risky is that at a time when the market is trading on macroeconomics more than possibly ever in its history, according to certain Barclays indicators? Yeah, I think interesting, Lisa, that we've already had uh, enormous flows into the dollar that relate to this sort of so-called flight to quality. Uh, I wouldn't get too hooked up on the word quality, but uh, by again, by default, the dollar has uh, drawn in something to the tune of $1.4 trillion of short-term flows between the end of 2019 and uh, Q1 of 2022, a staggering number. So a lot of the dollar strength does relate to short-term flows, uh, concerns about liquidity elsewhere, concerns about price action and risk uh, elsewhere, and uh, the dollar is the main beneficiary in this cycle. There are some other uh, beneficiaries, of course. Switzerland uh, has drawn in a huge num number as well in terms of um, uh, dollars in relation to GDP, so you know, big, a, a big level of support for the Swissy as well. Um, and the notable uh, outflows have occurred from China. So uh, John and Tom were talking a lot yesterday, Alan, about how even if the ECB hikes rates substantially, it's not going to support the euro. What could potentially stave off the decline? How steep could the decline be in the euro versus the dollar if we see energy prices continuing to climb to new highs as they are today? Yes, I think it's a short term story and there's a long term story. Uh, over the longer term, if Europe and the ECB stick to hiking interest rates because they see through this energy crisis, then the Europe, euro in particular will benefit. I think you'll see the euro solidly above parity in 2023 under that kind of scenario if we get through the winter. <clears throat> I think it's a case of navigating the winter. And I, you know, I wouldn't rule out, it's not our central forecast, but I certainly wouldn't rule out numbers like uh, 0 0.95 on euro dollar if the uh, crisis, uh, the energy crisis turns into rationing, for example, and real restrictions in terms of output. At the moment, we're thinking in terms of a, um, a, a slight recession, i.e., you know, a slight negative growth in the likes of Germany. But if that turns into something that's uh, much worse than that, that's not what the markets uh, are pricing in at this point. Hey, Alan, I've got to wrap it up and ask you about whether you expect some tension between central banks at some point, between the ECB, the Federal Reserve, between the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England. Clearly, euro dollar and a break of parity is not what this ECB wants. Clearly, a break of 118 is not what this Bank of England wants. When do you expect there to be some real tension on the international stage? 
Yeah, I don't think we're there. I think uh, central banks generally believe in flexible exchange rates. They believe, I think, that the market is saying something in terms of terms of trade shocks in particular that we've been very sharply uh, moving ag you know, against the likes of uh, the euro in particular, uh, sterling to a degree, and it's actually been helpful for the dollar. So I think you don't want to fight. Uh, real forces like terms of trade. Uh, you don't want to fight monetary policy either, but I think the terms of trade elements are, are, very, are very much underestimated. So I think in this instance, uh, the central banks are not going to push back in a big <clears> way. Adam Ruskin of Deutsche Bank. Alan, great to catch up. TK, this is a big problem. It's got to be a problem already for the ECB, for the Bank of England and right. other central banks too. You can do the math. You can do the math on the terminal. Alan Ruskin is expert at this. And to his point, we are not anywhere near some form of drama like a Plaza Accord level. We made a joke yesterday about the Grizzly Accord. I think what you'd hear here is they don't need it. The, you know, they don't... Are we getting closer they, to that? Are we getting we, closer we to that? We are definitely moving in that direction, and that's a concern, and to be prepared for it. But those stresses just aren't but, there yet. Where are they on level? I'm going to guess, you know, 0 0.90 euro. Oh, Ramo, this is a problem already. I suggest it's a problem already for the ECB and the Bank of England that these weak currencies are not helping them at all. Yeah, although, what are they going to do about it? And this is the conundrum that I think a lot of people are facing, which is they are facing inflation they have not faced for 30 some odd years, 40 some odd years. In the face of that, what do they do? What does that accord look like? How do they project out what the inflationary trend is going to be over the longer term in an era of deglobalization and structurally potentially higher commodity costs? Did you see the team at Capital Economics this yes. morning? Capital Economics came out a little bit earlier this morning and essentially said the question is no longer whether Germany enters recession, but how deep it is. Lisa, that's where we're at in Europe. We know where we are in China. It's not pretty. I just wonder at what point we start thinking about this really hitting the United States. And what really struck me this week, and I think it struck you too, how quickly we were to just ignore the PMIs out of the United States as if they don't matter, just wait for the ISM. Just ignore the PMIs. Yeah, negative data at this point is being looked at as peripheral, even when it comes to home housing prices. If you take a look at housing uh, activity, people are like, ah, eh, it's money, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. With Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovich, I'm Jonathan I'm Farrow. We're an open house in Jackson tomorrow. From Jackson Hole, Wyoming. What are you four, doing there? Drink it. 4.5 million. Four million. Four, there last four, night. Four, four, is there a party 4. there? 4.5 million for a shack. It's a starter. Is there a party there you want to talk about? <laughs> Live from Jackson Hole this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. There's more pressure on consumers in France and Germany today after power prices rose to record highs. They're now about 10 times higher than what they were a year ago. The astronomical rise is being driven by tighter gas supplies from Russia that pushes up the price of the gas that fuels Europe's power stations. China has stepped up its attempts to stimulate the economy. It's adding $146 billion of spending, largely focused on infrastructure spending. That won't likely go far enough to counter the damage from repeated COVID lockdowns and a property market slump. President Biden's plan to forgive a portion of student loans held by ten of millions of people will ripple through the economy, but no factor will be more closely watched than inflation. Bloomberg Economics sees the potential to add as much as two tenths of a percentage point to the inflation rate next year. That comes at a time when inflation is already at a four decade high. In Uvalde, Texas, the school board has fired the school police chief following that mass shooting in which 19 fourth graders and two teachers died. An investigation described Pete Arredondo as the commander responsible for police response. Law enforcement waited outside the school for more than an hour while the gunman was inside. And Swiss drug maker Novartis planned to spin it off its Sandoz unit. That would create the largest European generic and biosimilar drug company. The unit generated $9.7 billion last year. That is more than 18% of the parent company's sales. Novartis will now concentrate on developing breakthrough medicines. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
Live from Jackson Hole this morning, good morning. We'll be catching up with the good and the great over the next 24 hours. The good and the great that have had a difficult time calling this economy over the last 12 months. Your equity market going into that, futures shaping up as follows. Just about positive on the S&P 500, fading just a little bit though, up about five or six tenths of 1%. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley yesterday absolutely scathing about the idea of making a call of new highs on this equity market anytime soon. I'll bring you those comments a little bit later. I want to talk about the bond market as well. We've mentioned this a few times. Lisa's been talking about it through the week too. Yields at the front end just climbing back towards 340 in yesterday's session. We back away by a couple of basis points this morning down to 337. Down a couple of basis points into Chairman Powell's speech tomorrow. Looking at foreign exchange, this is how we started the program this morning. Euro dollar <clears throat> at about 99.85. A stronger euro today. But TK, this has got to be a problem for the ECB a problem for the Bank of England, who are grappling with much, much higher inflation than they would like. And yeah. on the imported inflation side, certainly a weaker currency, a weaker euro, a weaker pound sterling, is not going to help yeah. them. One of the great things, is, John, that we've got on radio, I'm holding my iPhone, we've got the Bloomberg all squeezed into an iPhone, and John, it really works. And the data point, to your point, is yen. Yen hasn't moved, 136.54. Powell gives a different speech with yen at 138, and certainly 140 well, weak yen the, the is unimaginable. Japan, the Bank of Japan hasn't moved either, right? Yeah. That, that's the big difference between, say, the BOJ, the ECB, and the BOE. Yeah. At least, as you know, the BOE and the ECB, they're staring down really, really high inflation. I want to keep going back to this. City earlier this week. Yeah. We should not let this go. No. City earlier this week coming out with a forecast for 18% CPI in the UK in January. That was just sort of a number we threw out there and we talked about a little bit. But can you imagine 18%? Inflation in the UK. Well, this is what people are gaming out, and this is really on the heels of energy, and it's not just the UK. You're dealing with it in Europe as well. I just want to note that the euro uh, valuation that you're talking about, the below parity is coming as traders price in the most hawkish moves ever from the ECB in the past few decades. This is a game changer in terms of the scenario for central banks where the potency is in question of their policy. Not just that, the front end of the German yield curve I think has quadrupled yeah. in the last month or so and yet Tom, we've got a weaker currency. That's a problem. The prospect of higher interest rates, yes still, a weaker currency. Well, Lagarde missing from these meetings, but ECB represented in full force here, and they'll have comments, I'm sure, in the coming uh, days. Right now, Seth Carpenter joins us, the chief global economist at Morgan Stanley, and what's so important about Dr. Carpenter is the historical perspective. Let us frame that at Jackson Hole, this began in August of 07. I have the fondest recollection of Stanley Fisher on the phone, urgent conversations, two weeks after your world and our world blew up. Ben Bernanke rewrote his speech uh, on August 31st, 15 years ago. It is not the responsibility of the Federal Reserve, nor would it be appropriate to protect lenders and investors from the consequences of their financial decisions. 15 years on, Seth Carpenter, it didn't work out. Balance sheet dynamics, original monetary <laughs> policy. Explain to us how we finally extricate ourselves from a 15-year experiment that has gone wrong. Yeah, I think that quotation from Ben is important. Uh, it sort of is, was supposed to have put paid to the idea that there's a Fed put. The, the problem in so many people in interpreting what happened, though, is the financial system is so fundamental to the U.S. economy that uh, even if you're not trying to save investors from their decisions, if you're trying to save the economy, you, you end up uh, intervening in a big way in markets. I think your question, though, about extricating the balance sheet, they are set at the beginning of next month to double the pace of the runoff of the balance sheet. Uh, the market knows that it's coming. I think the proof will be in the pudding, though, once that extra paper really starts to hit people's balance sheets, exactly how smoothly markets absorb the, the, right. the runoff. Seth Carpenter, what happens to our viewers and listeners if we get a Mohammed al and I'm going to call it 4% level, or Anna Wong at Bloomberg Economics? How does that destabilize our financial system? Uh, if we get, if the Fed takes the funds rate up to 4%, Tom? Yes, yes. <clears throat> well, I mean, first, I think we have to admit that that's clearly in the realm of possibility. The peak rate, uh, I've been reminding uh, our clients, 
where the Fed ends up with the, the funds rate is not sort of uh, something they know ex ante. It's not a goal that they're shooting at beforehand. It's the result of how the economy is evolving as they tighten policy. I thought there was interesting comments from Rafael Bostic of the Atlanta Fed earlier today in the news uh, that, you know, they've got more data coming in. Those data could come in much stronger than they think. And those sort of uh, determinations is going to help them decide 75 or 50 at the next meeting and, and ultimately where things end up. So how do we get to 4%? I think we end up at 4% if the economy actually is uh, fundamentally stronger for the real side of the economy than, than uh, we're forecasting right now. Seth, you mentioned QT as well, and I think we've got to pick up on that. I caught up with your colleague, Mike Wilson, just yesterday. I want to read a quote, share a quote of his from yesterday's appearance on this program. To be making some big call about new highs is, quite frankly, it's irresponsible, given what's going on with the Fed and QT coming. Seth, it's remarkable to me, and I'd like to know what your conversations with clients sound like right now, but hardly anyone talks to us about QT, the impact on the market that it could have, and the impact for that matter, on the economy as well. Seth, how are you thinking about that dynamic as it's set to ramp up and kick in through the next several months? I mean, I think it's a critical part of the Fed's policy. Uh, Mike has been bearish for a while, and I think, uh, you know, the recent bear market rally that he's sort of not particularly enthusiastic about, apart from that, the sell-off that we've seen earlier this year has been very consistent with this call. What is the Fed trying to do with higher interest rates, with uh, the unwind of the balance sheet. They are trying to tighten financial conditions to slow the economy down, not just a little bit, slow it down so much that the inflationary pressures abate over time. That kind of slowing growth, slowing in spending in the economy can't possibly be good for earnings. And I think, uh, you know, our economic view and Mike's view on equities are very much aligned in that regard. But Seth, there's a larger point here, which is how do we uh, look at inflation and what the Fed is combating? And I say this because is it just about the strength of the economy or is it about a fear that is growing among Fed officials as per a Wall Street Journal article that came out yesterday that this inflation is much more intractable than they previously thought, is rooted in a, dis, uh, a, a sort of reversal of the 90s globalization as well as structurally higher commodity prices? How much are you really looking at that changing Fed policy? policy over a longer term? Uh, key question, and I, I think you want to break inflation, at least conceptually, into three different parts. One is the, the part of inflation that the Fed really can't control by itself and could very well go away on its own. And there I'm talking about energy prices, food prices. Uh, we've seen oil prices peak and start to come off. So part of that inflation looks like it should take care of itself. Then there's the part of inflation that really is driven by strong underlying aggregate demand. So if you think about housing inflation, 40% of core CPI inflation is owner's equivalent rent and tenant's rent. That's really driven by the strong underlying economy and the continued strong job gains, right? Over 500,000 jobs. And then the third component, though, is, is the, mind, the mindset, the psychology, when economists call inflation expectations. And I think that last part is where, you know, the Fed has a right to be worried. What happens if everyone just starts building at higher prices? So what what's the solution? I think the Fed solution, and I happen to agree with it, is slow the economy down. It's growing faster than can possibly be sustained long term. 500,000 jobs per month just can't be sustained for that long. Slow it down, get realized inflation down, and then rely on the idea that slowing realized inflation, especially as energy prices come off, is going to prevent that psychological change to, 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 to the higher sustained inflation. Hey, Seth, appreciate your time, as always. Seth Carpenter there of Morgan Stanley. His comments on the economy, very much in line with the comments we had from Mike Wilson on the equity market of Morgan Stanley just yesterday. And I want to reflect on what Bob <coughs> Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management had to say on this market as well. And let's be clear about Bob through this year. He's not been a perma bear. He's actually liked high yield when spreads gapped out wider to about 580 basis points. High yield spreads came all the way back in to somewhere close to 400 basis points. Guess what he thinks now? He thinks yesterday, rich. this is what he said yesterday, he thinks we're rich, almost his words precisely, and he thinks looking out to next year, you can have a situation where high yield spreads gap out maybe to 650, 
pushing 700 basis points. Now, if Bob Michael's right, and you have a dynamic where high yield is back out at 650, 700 basis points, got to imagine where this equity market is, Lisa, with that going on. Well, and this is the weakness in the economy that the Fed is trying to Here engineer that has not been priced in to oh, not only the equity markets, but also the credit markets. When the credit markets start to get a whiff of it, yeah. is that the signal to the equities, hey, yeah. start getting a little more I'm going to move my chair one inch away from these two. From you guys the are so gloomy. I'm here in the majesty. Of, I'm here in the majesty <laughs> of Wyoming. There are no empty seats on any airplanes north to south from Phoenix sure. to Anchorage. The real estate price in Jackson Hole is comical the way it is. We have we have people driving us around that like commute from Idaho, which I think is like a million miles away. I think the gloom is unfounded. It's a stated story. I get it. But there's an optimism out there that America can, can work through this versus other more right. static okay. economies. We're talking past each other, though, a little bit, just in terms of, you At know, 3 there a.m., is... we're way talking <laughs> past each other. <laughs> okay, well, maybe that's an evergreen comment. But, <clears throat> we're, you know, th there's a question about longer term making it work and shorter term a pretty massive sea change in inflation and what the Fed's role has to be in combating it. And I think that's what we're talking about. I'd go about. another step further. And Tom, I think you're on the same page. How many times have you talked about the two Americas? Our experience on a plane coming to Jackson Hole and landing at an airport with about that 10 different private jets. That was commercial flight 10 in different ages. private it was jets amazing. lined up. Exactly. It's very different to the experience of the stat that we read out yesterday on this program. One in six Americans are falling behind on their utility bills. Do you not think there's something going on here? I think we can't just make these broad based assumptions about the strength of the overall <clears throat> consumer. And, and critical in sort of recession, if that's what we're in, these people are crushed in the middle class of America. I'm sorry, Paul has to address that tomorrow. Chairman Powell coming up tomorrow, live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming this morning. Good morning to you all with Lisa Rabbits and Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow. I this just saw Buffalo. It's Bloomberg <laughs> surveillance. <laughs> your Buffalo There's spray? like 20 bison out there. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The Biden administration has won a judge's order ensuring women in Idaho can get abortions in medical emergencies. That came less than a day after the administration lost a similar fight in Texas. The mixed outcomes point to a hotly contested court battles ahead. In the UK, two research groups say the government will have to draw up previously unthinkable measures on the energy crisis. The Resolution Foundation and the British Chambers of Commerce are calling for COVID-style emergency support to deal with soaring costs. Natural gas prices are now 10 times higher than the last decade's average. In Los Angeles, a jury has awarded the widow of basketball star Kobe Bryant $16 million in damages over photos taken at the scene of the helicopter crash that killed her husband. The spouse of another victim was awarded $15 million. The photos were taken by emergency personnel. Los Angeles taxpayers will foot the bill. More signs of weakness in the semiconductor industry. NVIDIA gave a disappointing forecast for the current period. That comes two weeks after the company warned that sales for the latest quarter would come in well below original expectations. And Bed Bath & Beyond is closing in on a lifeline from Six Street Partners. Bloomberg's learned that home goods retailer is in talks for a new line of credit that may be around $375 million. That will give Bed Bath & Beyond breathing room while sales slump and it burns through cash. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Is that the Fed basically stops um, uh, by the end of the year? I mean, you basically you're going to be at 350, and the hiking cycle is going to be done. But the real risk is that the Fed does not unhitch its wagon from um, inflation, particularly headline prices, and that they just keep on going. That was Tom Porcelli of RBC Capital Markets <clears throat> just yesterday. If you're just tuning in on TV and radio, there is a reason we are indoors, and it is not grizzly bears. 
the weather's appalling outside, so the team's done a fantastic job overnight. That is the truth. <laughs> Don't start rumours and conspiracy theories. <laughs> Carry on. The team spent the last several hours putting together a little mini studio inside the lodge. So it means that we can be very critical of the Federal Reserve now, but at some point in the next hour, Chairman Powell's going to wake up and walk past. And, and there will be really laudatory. Uh, maybe we'll be super supportive <laughs> of that speech you did 12 months ago, because, Tom, how could he possibly know that inflation would not be temporary and so-called transitory? Well, we're going to see on that, and that's certainly the arch theme here is the look back, but I think the look forward is just as important. What I would note in coming to Jackson Hole is you see front and center elements of the drought that is across this nation. John, some of when we came when we oh, you came mentioned up, that, yeah. the, the, the water level was way, way lower, the lack of snow. I've never seen two years in a row here with a real lack of snow. The future's right now positive, about a half of 1% on the S&P 500. Just to whip through some of the price action out there for you. Yields coming back in, two, three basis points <clears> on a two-year. Mentioned this a few times already. We'll keep going over it. Came very close to the intraday year-to-date highs, multi-year highs on a two-year yield of 345 just yesterday, just short of that, Tom, at about 340. Right now, 336. To the chairman's speech tomorrow, the cliche, and this from Senator Edwards of Louisiana, John Edwards, years and years ago, is of two Americas, but maybe it's three Americas. Wendy Schiller now joins us, director of the Taubin Center for American Politics at Brown University. And Wendy, here's the reality. The first three conversations I had in Jackson Hole off the fancy airplane were with people with foreign accents. Immigration is critical to the spirit of this nation. It's hugely contentious. I want you to describe, as Powell speaks, as Biden moves forward, what they do with our three Americas, the haves, the have-nots, and the immigrants that are keeping us going. Well, you're raising an extraordinarily important part that even among immigrants, there's wide disparity. There are skilled immigrants. There are people who come to go to college in America or graduate school and stay, uh, particularly in the tech industry, for example. Uh, and then there are immigrants that are you, are working the sort of lowest wage jobs in a lot of our industries and our sectors. Some are documented, some are not. So there's and there's generations now of immigrants. So even our political assumptions about how different ethnicities or nations of origin people vote, that's changing all the time because it's not just first generation or even second generation now. We're talking about third and fourth generation who have very different views than their parents or grandparents. So the politics and the economics are really every year are getting more and more um, disparate. They're really different, particularly where people live across the country. What have you learned in the recent days, the recent weeks, the primary season as we move to the midterms and critically to 2024? What is the power for the president, the power for the chairman of immigrants, first generation, the kid from Belarus that drove me yesterday, the, the people in Pueblo, Colorado, as an example, the Latino vote there that's shifting dramatically Republican? What's their power that you've learned about? Well, one of the most important things is that when you are an immigrant and you are not yet a, 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 a citizen, for example, you know, you obviously have different uh, political rights, but immigrants are not, do not qualify for federal benefits or usually state benefits unless you have relocation assistance, meaning they have to work for whatever they have. So when you see the Biden administration doing things like forgiving student loans, which we could talk about, uh, for people who go to college, only few, less than 40 percent of America goes to college, 60 percent doesn't go to college, and you are not eligible for any of these benefits that you see being given away, that sticks with you. That stays with you as you go through the naturalization process and become a voting citizen. So I think that's what the Republicans figured out, is that Democrats think immigrants will be, uh, for them, uh, because of the rhetoric, particularly for Donald Trump, and among others. But, in fact, immigrants tend to go the other direction because they say, well, we work for everything we have, we're not eligible for anything, and you're giving our money away. So I think that is a big divide, and I think it's so a chronic and growing misperception by the Democrats. Let's talk a little bit about the student loan relief that we heard about from yesterday uh, from President Biden. A lot of people are saying this is going to help heading into the midterm elections. What's your view on how inflation muddies the water and the estimates from a whole host of different shops, partisan uh, and bipartisan, uh, that this will be somewhat inflationary on the margins? Well, I think people vote when they're most people vote when they have an axe to grind or they're really enthusiastic. So we know that Republicans have an axe to grind, and we know that people who are suffering from inflation, gas prices, and many of whom may not have gone to college uh, or aren't in college, 
uh, or paid off their student loans already will not benefit from this at all. So, you know, if you're going to raise the deficit a little bit, you're going to add to inflation. That rhetoric helps the Republicans. And uh, people who are college educated, the Democrats have a majority of those voters now. They're voting Democratic anyway, and we don't know how enthusiastic they are. So I'm not sure this $10,000 or even $20,000 gets them out the door to vote. And lastly, students who are in college, states have done a pretty good job, particularly Republican-controlled states, of limiting their ability to vote their residency requirements, making it more difficult for them to vote if they're not there full time. So in some yeah. ways, you're not even going to get that student vote that you hope to get from this move. Wendy, you're a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat, and you also are at a university that is very prestigious uh, and known uh, for, for, for its academic prowess. Do you think that this is a good policy for getting uh, prices of tuition lower, or do you think it inflates it further? Um, well, Lisa, first of all, registered independent. So there, there's my political affiliation for you. Uh, I think that, you know, university costs are outside my lane. You know, I'm a, I'm a research and teaching professor. But, you know, every business, and you know, higher education is a business now, raises its cost depending on how much money it can make. So if, in fact, loans are forgiven and, and there is a, a greater possibility of, of affording college, then there isn't any reason, really, for universities to cap their prices. So I think the whole student loan system, I think, contributes to the rise uh, in tuition uh, that universities charge. And like any other business, it's a competitive consumer-driven business now, they're going to raise their prices when they can. Wendy Schiller of Brown University. I apologize for my colleague. We're all independent and impartial uh, around here, Lisa. <laughs> did you know that? Sorry. Did you know I, that? You I can't, didn't, you can't, I didn't you mention this. I wasn't accused of being affiliated with a political that she's, party. I'm not. I'm going to stand down. I'm going to go get <laughs> we, eaten by a bear. We can, we can talk <laughs> about the price of Brown University, <laughs> though. And TK, I think we've got yeah, to do yeah. that. We've got to do it. Let's touch on the heart of the problem. And Brown has done it several times this week. It's the price of college tuition in America. Okay, you ready? All in Brown University, 80000 Four hundred forty-eight dollars per year, a year, and that doesn't include Wendy Schiller's classic textbook. But that is for a university that is highly respected, and where a lot of the people who go have more money to spend. This is the issue when you have for-profit universities and people not completing those degrees, and whether they get the jobs afterwards that give them the salaries that make it worthwhile. And this is a larger structural problem. It is a massive one. How do you get it done? Unclear. I tell you, people in the UK falling off their seats. Listen to some of this. 9,000 sterling domestic to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Oh. And I'm hearing 80,000 US. 80,000 okay, US. John, let's bring this down. Leeds, Chelsea, worst own goal that, ever that, by the goalie. Stuff. Well and done. The, bottom, the bottom line is, is this a massive own goal for President Biden? That's we'll really what Tom. this is about. Yeah, that's we'll Do you like that soccer talk? Uh, that was beautiful. No one in Wyoming so plays soccer. Proud no of you. one. There is, you is don't know Wyoming that. Wyoming is you soccer free. That. We know you this. You don't know that. <laughs> Life of Jackson Hole, the important stuff. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs>really reasonable to think that core inflation could surprise people to the downside. You're seeing inflation expectations rise quite meaningfully across the globe. That acceleration that we've seen in wages, you'll probably see that showing up in prices. So we could actually accelerate in some components of inflation. What's very, very unique about this cycle is that recession risks and inflation risks are at odds with each other with respect to policy. We're on the cost or we're in a global recession as we speak. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. <clears throat> Live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio, alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrell, with equity futures just about positive. It's the drumbeat, TK, going into Chairman Powell tomorrow. Into Chairman Powell tomorrow, and it's the two Americas of a booming Wyoming that we're seeing. We saw that coming in here through the airport and the prosperity of a Wyoming uh, that's part of a booming West, even within drought, and that's part of what he has. He has a, product a, a productivity dearth, no question about that. He's got massive data dependence, and it's how does he speak to the tension. You mentioned earlier the Bloomberg article of one in six Americans having trouble paying their electric sure. bills, that's the core issue right now. How does now. he speak to the data point at the moment, Lisa, 8.5% CPI in America? And the fact that this is going to have and is already having a ramification that people are feeling. You're seeing on the margins people changing what they eat, what they buy, how they travel because of that 8.5% inflation, which goes to the momentum that you talk about, Tom, <clears throat> 
and how quickly does it fade? Well, how do you speak to tomorrow with the strength and of today? And who does he speak to? Last night, to greet Jacob Frankel, the former governor of the Bank of Israel, iconic within foreign exchange academics. John, does he speak to an international audience, including talk about challenges, Governor Bailey, the I Bank of England? I think it is tremendously difficult for this chairman to navigate the problems abroad with so many problems at home. If he's worried about having his message being misinterpreted, I think that the greatest route to go down to really confuse things is to start talking about Europe, start talking about China and everything else that's happening on the planet. He's got an inflation problem. Does he have a market problem as well? And we need to talk about that too. This equity market bottomed on June 16th. And since then, until very recently, we had equity markets to the moon, Bramo, and we had credit spreads tighter, 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 tighter. And we need to ask whether we've seen an unwarranted easing of financial conditions relative to what they need to do to get CPI inflation back in. And in the previous communication, he did not push back dramatically against that market action. Does he do that now, especially considering the fact that we're looking right now at markets that are pricing in, they're moving away Since from some of the rate Since when does a central bank target. leader jawbone markets? Are I you kidding me? They don't. No, Where have I you don't. been the last 10 he's, years? This is an academic I just don't think he's going to come out and say the markets are wrong. He's just not going to do that. They've been doing that for the last 10 years. I, I think they've been validating things, think running away from things. Tell me what happened in late 2018, December I, 2018. What the happened? Red Sox traded for there we go. Bogarts, I think. Come on. We all no, know what happened I, in the market and how it changed policy for this Federal Reserve. Okay, the market changed policy, but the idea that a central banker is going to lecture the markets at Jackson Hole, I just think is, is, is not correct. Lisa, it would not be the first time. <laughs> It would not be the first time, especially because financial conditions are the mechanism that they use to transmit financial policy, to transmit monetary policy to the rest of the economy. That's one big issue. Are you doing mo moose noises again? Is that what that was? <laughs> no, that was a bison noise. That was a bison. <laughs> Sound effects through today. Okay, oh, just please. to confirm for everyone, we're not inside because of bears and... Bison. Bison. Because we have one. Yeah. We're inside because the weather's so bad. The team put together a little mini studio for us inside the lodge where Chairman Powell will be walking around a little bit later. No. And hopefully, yeah. hopefully if the weather gets better, story. we'll be going back Can outside Can you be honest and tell them the truth? I did an all-nighter, folks, with some of the great people here, and they just set up a studio inside Let's around Let's the difference between the Tom and I. <laughs> We're at a diner scene. Okay, we walk in. Bow tie. Suit. Tie. Cowboys, Cowboys just lined up. Like out of Honestly, central casting. And just like ripping, off, of ripping off his bow tie. I'm taking off my tie. Esther George looks up at us and then goes, here come the New Yorkers. Walks over, <laughs> welcomes us. TK sits there, two martinis in front of him. And the Kansas City Fed shout over to me, are you going to look after Tom tonight? <laughs> what do I do? I go home and go to bed. I, I have no say. idea what happened to this one in the hours after that. I, there was very careful analysis of the Fed. Was there? A, there was I'm a, sure there was. was I, look, a, I look forward to the coverage on that. Uh, let's hope you're dialed in and coverage. ready. I'm sure. <laughs> Futures right now, they are positive a half of 1% on the S&P 500. <laughs> Lisa, the bond market has been about yields right, higher just yesterday. Yields coming in at the front end. We're down two basis points, 337 on a two-year. All right, so today, obviously, we're in Jackson Hole. It is day one, and we've got a whole host of great guests, including Esther George, who I'm sure will be checking in on Tom. Uh, Seth Carpenter and Megan Green also joining us. 8.30, we get initial jobless claims, and this is Eastern time, not uh, not where we are right now, but how much do we get a read from the labor market of a softening and how much is this uh, really what the Fed is looking for? And there are a whole host of retail earnings today. And I know that, Tom, you were skeptical about Dollar Tree, Dollar mm. General, why we care. This is the other half. This is where people shop when they're looking for a bargain. We're also getting Gap and Williams-Sonoma as well as uh, Ulta. But how much do we get a sense? People are pulling back from their spending. We saw this already at a whole host of different companies, including Nordstrom, even the higher end, seeing that Have pain. we all forgotten that headline from Walmart earlier this month? Walmart came out and said, high-income, middle-income Americans are now coming to Walmart. <clears throat> That's a big change, Tom. High-income America is going to Walmart because it's not just low-income workers getting squeezed. To your point, and you've made this over the last several months, people are looking at the bills and they're looking to go elsewhere. Own brand store, but brand we, products, that's where a lot of business has been okay, done. I, this, the, the, the gloom, who brought the gloom fest here? Marco Kalanovich, who's, you know, measured. Okay. Is he a okay. mentor? Okay, J.P. Morgan, he's measured, and he talks about measured. a glide path down in inflation solved by a lessening of supply-side shock, okay. like something Dean, Dean Hubbard would talk about. You're really scraping the barrel for the bulls if you're going to 
the perm bulls. Well, if I'm not doing it for the bison, I'm doing it for the bulls. Are there bulls out here? Let's get to the theme of the moment in Jackson yeah. Hole, Wyoming. Here's the title. Reassessing constraints on the economy and policy. Very good. Let's have that conversation now with Glenn Hubbard, the professor of finance and economics at the Columbia Business School. Glenn, great to have you with us, sir. Can you frame how challenging this moment is for this Fed chair? Well, I think it's, it's very challenging for two reasons. One, it's momentous time in the economy with both significant uncertainty about inflation and recession. Two, it's important for him and, and communication. I, I actually have a old whip inflation now button here from the Ford administration. And I think Chair Powell needs to do a bit better in expressing more some candor about the past, not necessarily a mea culpa, but for what happened and about the future, what it's going to take, as well as talking about the difficult path of getting inflation all the way back down to 2%. Getting it down to 4 may be straightforward, getting <clears> it to 2 much harder. Glenn Hubbard, the arc of Republican economics represented by so many here at Jackson Hole is that the system will solve itself. Is a general statement, is the religion of supply side economics or the religion that the American economy can heal itself, has that failed? I don't think so. I mean, the economy has a lot of self-equilibrating mechanisms. The question is over what time period and in the presence of such large shocks. I think policy still has a role to play. It had a role to play in the COVID pandemic. And the Fed just can't wait to let inflation work itself out. So, uh, Dean Hubbard, Glenn, what's your view on our debate that we were just having about whether uh, this Fed chair will speak to markets, what he will say about their enthusiasm about some sort of pivot or some sort of pause in uh, Fed rate hikes? Well, I think the message he could give, going back to the point I said about candor, about where we have to go, is what it would take to reduce inflation. I, I don't think he's literally going to lecture the markets and say the stock market's too high or something like that. But I think he could outline a path that says we have work to do. Getting that work done requires tighter financial conditions. And speaking in general terms, I, I think that would be wise to make that kind of communication to the public and to the markets. There was, a, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, I keep mentioning this because it really caught my attention, about whether we have seen the end of the low rate policy. This is what PIMCO has put out there. And the possibility of inflation remaining high for a longer period of time due to a deglobalization, due to structurally higher commodity prices, due to a lack of investment over the past few years. Do you buy into this theory? And if the Fed does, what does that mean in terms of how high rates have to stay and for how long? Well, I, I think there's certainly something to the fact that we have demographic changes, structural changes, globalization changes. I'd be hesitant to draw straight lines and say that's just going to be permanent, but I think it's definitely something to watch. To my mind, the concern for the Fed ought to be is probably two worlds, one in which we keep inflation expectations anchored around 2%, the other in which they go off kilter. I think that's the challenge the chair faces, and you'll have to, quote, do what it takes to make that happen. Hey, Glenn. Thank you, sir. It's good to hear from you, as always. My pleasure. Glenn from Columbia Business School. That's, that's been a theme that's come up multiple times over the last week, the last few months on this program, and I don't think that theme's gone away. How much weakness is this Fed willing to tolerate? What's the price of GDP that they're willing to pay, Tom, to get inflation well, yeah. back down towards time? We doubled, this is important. We double-barreled that yesterday and that there's a growth dynamic and a labor dynamic. That's the politics of it. How much will they tolerate? And the backdrop here, which we don't talk enough about, is productivity. And as a triple ratio, there's a lot of dynamics in this fancy word productivity. And it's a mystery now how we jumpstart American productivity. We were lucky, fortunate to catch up with Jan Hansius of Goldman earlier this yeah. week. And the point that he was making essentially, Lisa, is that the bar to cut, the hurdle, is really, really high. And effectively, what we have to be discussing is not the, the hurdle to cut interest rates. It's the hurdle to pause. Yes. At what point do they pause this hiking expedition, if you want to call it that, Pause and Very wait. Good. Pause and wait. Raise and hold, I think, is going to be a phrase you hear a lot this week. Wyoming. It's a good time for an expedition. I guess a rate hiking expedition actually makes perfect sense. Look, it's not just that, but also for how long do they pause. And this, to me, I think was the, the Jan Hatzias key point, which is it could be for years because that is where this economy is at in terms of inflation and strength. Jan was talking two years, maybe at 3.5%. Any animal noises? 
you're done. I'm going to squeeze one in. <laughs> uh, what, what was that? <laughs> what was that? That was the golden was eagle. That was the go <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Mohammed, if you're out there, you can postpone this appearance. We, can I? We'd, prefer, we'd prefer that you stay with us, though. Please. Mohammed Al Arian of Bloomberg Opinion and a whole lot more <laughs> is going to be joining us in about 50 minutes' time. Looking forward to it. From Jackson Hole, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic says that more strong data could lead the central bank to raise interest rates another three quarter of a percentage point. Bostic told the Wall Street Journal it's too soon to say the inflation surge has peaked. Tomorrow, investors will be listening to Fed Chair Jerome Powell's speech at Jackson Hole for clues about what the Fed will do at next month's policymakers meeting. China has stepped up its attempts to stimulate the economy. It's adding $146 billion of spending, largely focused on infrastructure spending. That won't likely go far enough to counter the damage from repeated COVID lockdowns and a property market that is slumping. There is more pressure on consumers over in France and Germany today after power prices rose to record highs. They're now about 10 times higher than what they were a year ago. The astronomical rise is being driven by tighter gas supplies from Russia that pushes up the price of gas that fuels Europe's power stations. In Uvalde, Texas, the school board has fired the school police chief following that mass shooting in which 19 fourth graders and two teachers died. An investigation described Pete Arredondo as the commander responsible for police response. Law enforcement waited outside the school for more than an hour whilst the gunman was in sight. Peloton reported for fiscal fourth quarter revenue that missed estimates. There was a big loss in the quarter as well, $1.2 billion. But the fitness company says that $415 million of that is going due to the ongoing restructuring. Peloton's number of connected fitness subscribers also was lower than expected. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg. Quick take powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Raising interest rates doesn't solve the supply side problem. It can even make it worse because what we want to do right now is invest more in the supply side bottlenecks. But raising interest rates makes it more difficult to make those investments. Joseph Stiglitz there, the Nobel laureate in economics, catching up with us in the last mm. Couple of days. Live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming this morning. Good morning to you all. Your equity market is shaping up as follows. Futures just about positive on the S&P 500. TK yields higher yesterday. Yields back in today. Just a couple of basis points. No real drama here as we set things up yeah, for a yeah. lot of Fed speak, a ton of Fed speak through the next 48 hours. The VIX came in, John, 24 to 22, which I think is, is important as a calming influence into the speech. But both you and I noticed a 3.40 two-year yield speaks volumes. Interesting, isn't it? That's a 10-day move that's tangible. Seeing it at the front end of Germany too, yeah. something we keep picking up on. Not seeing that translate into any real currency moves for the Europeans though. But that's the real takeaway. What will it take for the currency to strengthen? And then without that kind of follow through, what can the ECB do in light of the fastest inflation in decades? How do they counter that with policy? Well, but the zeitgeist of the last three days, Steve Englander is one example, is okay, you can make a weak dollar call, except you can't. And the resilient or even stronger dollar call seems to be the zeitgeist. Of the what moment. are we doing here through the next couple of days? And I know what we're doing here, so I'm not just saying, <laughs> you know, say, I'm not trying explain. to make a point here. It's the road to September 21 and the Fed's next meeting and beyond through next year as well, and perhaps even longer. We need to talk about September 8th and the ECB. I think September 8th and the ECB, we've got people essentially saying, Germany, it's not about if they go into recession, it's about how deep that recession is. And you've got a European well, Central Bank <clears throat> that's set to hike another yeah, 50 basis points in a couple of weeks' time. And Kit Jukes was really terse about this at Sakjen. He said, it's just about energy. And Steve Shork, who's encyclopedic on this, was adamant that energy in Europe matters to our American viewers and listeners. I, I mean, noticed Kit Jukes no at Sakjen just published moments ago. Effectively, the title essentially was, the news is dire, but is it any worse than expected? And that's the market question, isn't it? Now, we can all talk about the economist yeah, question, which sure. is, how bad sure. is the economy? For the market, is it better or worse than expected? Well, I think that it's as simple as that. And in the politic landscape, it is just the same. Is it better or worse than expected? Get out the calendar, and the calendar is simple. The September 
and November elections away. Jack Fitzpatrick joins from Washington right now. Jack, what is happening right now at the White House in terms of politics of September? Uh, the politics of September, big picture, the White House is trying to accomplish uh, everything it can, uh, especially looking at the student loan forgiveness measure uh, to deliver for probably more Democrats, their supporters who may wane or wax in enthusiasm uh, heading into the midterms, uh, probably more of those Democrats even than persuadable voters to try to get uh, their supporters to turn out in November. In, in in November, uh, and okay, also well, understanding that they may not have that many opportunities in future Congresses. Jack, in Pennsylvania, it's Fetterman against Oz. Are you telling me student loan debates matter over a choice there? Uh, I, well, that's what I'm getting at is I don't know the choice between Fetterman and Oz uh, is going to come down to someone's views on uh, student loan forgiveness. I, I think the focus on this kind of thing is uh, – is doing what they campaigned on uh, and giving Democrats something to be enthusiastic about because in a race like Fetterman versus Oz uh, in Pennsylvania, it, it, it's a truism to say it all comes down to turnout, but it, it seems especially true in a lot of these key races that if uh, the Biden administration can give their Democratic supporters something to be enthusiastic about, that may be more politically valuable to them than uh, going for the, the swing voters that may or may not really exist in a race like that. Meanwhile, perhaps the number that we are all watching most closely is 71 days. That is how many days the gasoline price, or petrol price, some <laughs> might say, has fallen in the United States. And how much is this really driving what we saw in 538, which is a more than 60 percent chance now being priced in that Democrats are going to keep the Senate? Uh, yeah, gas prices play into that. Uh, if, if inflation can wane at all from now to November, uh, that would be a good thing for Democrats. It's, uh, it's still an, a, a matter of the economy overall on net being a weakness for, for Democrats. Uh, it, when you look at a number like that from 538 on the Senate uh, outlook, keep in mind even Mitch McConnell has said probably a 50-50 proposition on which party ends up controlling the Senate, and, and he said candidate quality is an issue. Uh, Oz in Pennsylvania has had some bad polls. There have been complaints about how much he is or isn't on the campaign trail. They have not gotten uh, moderate swing state members to win Republican primaries in Arizona, Blake Masters. It's a, a lot of uh, Trump loyalists who lately have had some disappointing polls on the Republican side. Uh, so it may be gas prices. It may come down to a few weak candidates on the Republican side letting their side down and giving Democrats more of a chance than you would <clears throat> normally imagine in this kind of midterm. Hey, Jack, we've got to leave it there. Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government down in Washington, D.C. It's for me, Lisa, I get confused between Nat Gas and Gas and what we're talking about. I, I, I'm not I, saying I, say I, petrol. We, we could say, I'm not we could saying say, say no. petrol. Okay, but we could say Just, gasoline. You know, no, gasoline I, think that, okay. I think that that's fair. I'm but I think that actually there was a really interesting report that I was reading, and I'm just going to geek out for a second, about how... Um, well, is this you know, new? <laughs> an original moment? <laughs> this is just for the moment, uh, as, as, as Tom practices his, uh, his buffalo noises. How much we see <clears> the <throat> other side of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve release when it sure. ends over in September, in October, how does that change the 71-day streak that we've seen? Can I bring some perspective into this of where we are, sure. please? It's cozy. In sync with the neighborhood, the ranch-style home features a reimagined open layout. That means they knocked where a couple walls down. Are you ready, John? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, but sure. 1,200 squ per square foot, $2.7 million for a tiny ranch house in oh. Jackson, Wyoming. And this is not shishi. This is like... You know, really Does that basic. explain the private jets at the airport that we saw yeah, I mean, lined up yesterday? Yeah, you know, Kanye waved to me. Um, what's important here is there's more private jets here than there are at Davos. They're coming in. You know what they're getting? Like Florida, there's no state taxes. It's, it's that complicated. Thanks for the story, though. No, <laughs> it was, it's a little color here. Up, I mean, cozy two you know, I, is Chairman Powell coming in on a, on a, a golf stream? I, you know. To stay in a cozy two bed.
Yeah. Jackson I, Hole. We'll have to see. Can I talk about gas prices, net gas prices in Europe? Up another 6% today after being up 8.6% yesterday. <clears throat> I've lost track how much we're up this month, but I can tell you, Lisa, it's a well, lot. Well, yeah, Lisa, $520 a barrel equivalent. There are the so many different equivalencies that I've looked at. The bottom line is when you see your gas, natural <clears> gas <throat> prices doubling in the span of two months, that changes the discussion for people trying to keep John, what's it mean for the people of Europe? You live this every day. With how many times have I used this word? Brutal. Brutal. And it's the number one issue on the phone with my mum every time we talk. The price of electricity, utility bills. It's going higher, higher, higher. Up next on this program, we'll hear from the Kansas City Fed President, Esther George, the host of this get-together, and we'll hear from Mike McKee as well. This is Bloomberg. Live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming this morning. Good morning, good morning. It is the annual Fed get-together. And the host of that get-together is the Kansas City Fed President, Esther George. She sat down with Bloomberg's Mike McKee and Kathleen Hayes. If you think about how tight the labor market is, we are operating with an unemployment rate that is below, I think, what most people would consider to be a normal or natural rate of unemployment. So that suggests to me that to get loosening in that labor market, to see some of this tightness come out of the economy, that you may well see uh, more unemployment uh, in the process of this tightening cycle. Well, you got two camps, one that says you need to keep going no matter what, and another that says you need to be careful because these are real people who lose jobs. So how much unemployment is too much? Well, I think anytime someone is unemployed that doesn't want to be, uh, you care about that. I think in the long run, which is where I'm focused, you have to have a sustainable economy. And the best path to full employment is going to be conditions of price stability. And so I think for the long run, that's where we have to be focused uh, to bring inflation down so that we can have those conditions. So what are you looking at when you see the housing market? We saw pending home sales, but they're the weakest again since the beginning or before the pandemic even. Mortgage rates have shot up. We know all kinds of people who backed out of wanting to buy a home because right. they're expecting prices to fall more. So is that uh, a welcome tightening in financial conditions? Is it a little bit more than the Fed has bargained for? Well, I think it's been one of the first places we've seen it. So you saw that initial tightening in mortgage rates come very quickly um, early in the tightening cycle. And that, of course, does affect the economics of someone being able to afford a mortgage, make that payment mm -hmm. they need to pay. So in some sense, this isn't surprising to see these numbers come off, to see sales come down. Whether the actual prices, the housing valuation uh, comes down consistent with that, I think we will still have to see, and I suspect that could be to come. You know, you just mentioned that uh, the funds rate could have to go above 4% mm -hmm. to get to the point where you're slowing down the economy and, and really slowing down demand. Uh, John Taylor, uh, author of The Taylor Rule and More, mm -hmm. who you know well, uh, just a couple of days ago on Bloomberg Television told me that he thinks the Fed should be aiming for 5% or even more if inflation does not start coming down more rapidly? Well, I think certainly if we don't see a response in bringing this imbalance between demand and supply uh, to bear on inflation, um, we will again have to consider where that uh, short-term interest rate is going to have to move. So you wouldn't rule out something that high? Well, I, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, I'm not suggesting that's where we're going. But the other thing, Kathleen, that I, I think we don't talk enough about is the sizable balance sheet that the Federal Reserve has and that we will be doing uh, runoff of that balance sheet. And again, understanding how these two things work together, um, I think it's going to be important to see how that runoff uh, works as we go through the year. And that's the other part of this rate increase environment that is important to watch, I think. What's the danger of recession that you see, and what would you see it in, in terms of indications that we are slipping into contraction? So, you know, again, when I go around my region, I don't hear many signs of that uh, it, from our contacts. What I hear is tight labor market, price pressures, supply constraints going on here. I will tell you, when I look at global growth, though, so we've seen the IMF cut its uh, forecast for global growth. We see the issues in China. We see Europe, and we know that that uh, reduction in demand uh, will affect our own growth here, simultaneous with the tightening cycle that the Fed is underway. So how it, it, how it comes out in balance uh, over time is hard to know. But I think, again, the focus on watching these imbalances resolve themselves are going to have 
multiple factors that will come to bear on them. President Biden has now uh, introduced a student loan forgiveness program, $10,000 or $20,000, depending on the program you were in per person, which is going to cost billions of dollars. And a lot of economists are worried this is going to be inflationary. Do you see it working against your goals? So I haven't looked at the, this particular uh, decision that came out, but I think always fiscal policy is something we will take in to understand. Is it an impact in the short term? Does it happen over a period of time that makes its particular impact to the economy there? So I don't have a sense of the particular impact here, again, given the size relative to our economy and uh, what we're looking at in consumption, um, I'd be hard pressed to say what I think its impact is right now. Speaking of your district, speaking of the world uh, economy and what's driving it right now, drought is big. It's, it's it, across much of the Western United States. In Europe now, um, where is it, is it the point yet where it enters into a factor in policy? And is something like drought and what it could do to production, our cultural production, all kinds of things, is it potentially a drag on the economy, which tilts you toward recession potentially? Is it something that boosts inflation? Because a lot of prices are going to get even higher, particularly for food. Yeah. So issues that affect our real economy are things that I think we have long taken into account. You think about a region like mine where agriculture um, is prominent. The idea that weather events, the idea that commodity prices all come to bear on how the economy does, what it contributes to GDP, where the constraints are um, in that sector. I think these events just are continuation of some of that, and the magnitude of them may change. But I will tell you, for example, in the Kansas City Fed District, drought in the western part of our region does have impact on the yields that are coming off these crops now. It will matter over time. Uh, farmers are used to dealing with that in many respects. Banks that lend to them are used to dealing with that. And I think in that sense, um, it will have the same impact on our policy that we see across many sectors of the economy. A very near-term decision, and every Fed bank president, every Fed official gets asked this all the time. <laughs> um, and especially you, because you did dissent against the first 75 basis point rate hike, and you just recently said you're going to continue to debate the, the needed size, 50 or 75, with your Fed colleagues. So again, when you see how well the economy is holding up and how little inflation has come down this far, um, what is your baseline? Is your baseline 50 and you're going to have to be talked into 75? What's going to tilt the balance for you? I mean, I supported 75 at the uh, July meeting. And I find it an interesting time when we debate 50 or 75, because who would have thought 50 would have yeah. been a more dovish view uh, than uh, 75? I think for me, coming into this September meeting, we're going to be looking again at an inflation report. We're going to be looking at a labor market report. And I think trying to draw some sense of whether we see continuation of things that we've seen over the summer. Uh, whether progress looks like it's meaningful in some way. I do look forward to getting back to a sustainable uh, rate path. Uh, that was my issue uh, at the June meeting. Again, no, no disagreement about the direction we are headed. But I think just being mindful of uh, the destination and how quickly we get there at a time when we're reducing the balance sheet. You've been doing this for a long time. The old adage was, don't fight the Fed. Why do you think the markets are fighting the Fed now and not listening to what you've been saying about how serious you are about taking on inflation? I don't know what drives the markets, Mike. I probably would not be uh, well positioned to say that. Certainly, it is important for our communications to be clear because we want financial conditions to tighten along with the direction we are moving around policy. So I think it puts a premium on being clear in our communication of having resolve toward the end game here. And again, the end game is to bring inflation back to our 2% target. And um, that's challenging in the environment we're in. We're coming off an unprecedented period. The economy, I think, in some respects, is still sorting itself out. We have global factors to take into that. So there's a lot to think about. I'm sure markets are thinking about that even as we proceed with this interest rate increase cycle. You're retiring at the end of the year. This is your last economic symposium. How do you think economics and the economy and the Fed have changed during your tenure? Well, a lot has been done. When you think about the great financial crisis uh, where the introduction of quantitative easing came about, zero interest rate policy, 
um, has been an extraordinary time uh, for the economy, for policy to think about um, how it responds to the economy. Also coming into a time when we have demographic changes, really broader changes around uh, the world. So the world continues to evolve in ways that sometimes look clear to us, mm -hmm. sometimes don't. But um, well. In, in this vein of, of here you are uh, uh, about to uh, end the, your wonderful tenure at the Kansas City Fed, this last part I would think has one of, been one of the very di most difficult parts, seeing inflation get out of control the way it has. What's the biggest lesson learned for you uh, for the Federal Reserve after having gotten into this situation and now needing to get out of it? So Kathleen, really, I'm going to answer that question by saying this is one of the things I'm looking forward to with the conference that we have this year, is really reassessing how we understood constraints over the last couple of decades, finding ourselves again in a place um, of high inflation, which we hadn't seen for some 40 years, and really being reminded what are those factors that um, are important to price stability. We know as our mandate uh, that that hasn't changed for a long time, even as the economy has evolved, even as the toolkit uh, may have evolved, but getting back to really thinking about um, how price stability is achieved, even as the world changes, I think, is going to be an important part of this discussion here at Jackson Hole Symposium. That was the Kansas City Fed President Esther George sitting down with Michael McKee and Kathleen Hayes. There will be an open position at the Kansas City Fed in the next 12 months. Tom Keynes dropped by to fill out an application yeah. form <laughs> and Mike McKee's jumped into his seat while TK's gone. Mike, great interview with you and Kathleen. I want to pick up on the very end of that interview when she said financial conditions need to tighten. Do you think this is going to be a theme here for you personally and for this event as they look at where markets have been the last couple of months and ultimately where they want to go? I think it's something that the markets and the Fed, I asked her about fighting the Fed, but they're agreed on the fact that uh, financial conditions have loosened and that doesn't help them get to where they're going because the only tool they have is to tighten financial conditions. So it should be that the markets understand that they have to go higher to get there. But there is a division between those who think inflation is the most important thing and those in the markets who think that maybe recession is coming and we need to react to that in time. And George in June dissented because she was worried about that long and variable lag for monetary policy hitting and that you could have policy really start to tighten at the time you go into recession. But she said uh, there isn't evidence yet of that and so she's still on the inflation fighting, fighting side. I don't expect them to give a state contingent forward guidance this week. I think they're done with that whole activity. So I'm not expecting them to say something like, if unemployment goes back to 4.5%, we'll back away. I think what we'd love to see, though, Mike, is if we're all trying to gauge this, what's the hurdle? How high is the hurdle for them to say, that's enough pain, we need to balance the two things now? Yeah, well, you heard her say, and I think most of the Fed people are agreed on this, that they don't know that, it, that they're anticipating going to close to four, but if it has to go to five, if it has to go to six, then they'll do that. And, and her argument, which a lot of them make, is that unemployment is so low, below the natural rate of unemployment, that you've got that room to do it without pitching us into recession. Esther George has had a more dovish tack. This is sort of a different tone, basically acknowledging that there is a certain weakness in the labor market that is necessary to get back to price stability. How much will that be the theme, that they don't want to give anything to markets to give them a chance to rally further? Well, I think it, it, what we've seen from Jay Powell over the course of the last six months or so is an acknowledgement that unemployment is going to rise. The only question is how much. And he said 4.1% or so is okay, uh, which is the lower end of what they think the natural rate of unemployment is. But if it goes much higher than that, you get into this political area of uh, the politicians starting to put pressure on you because you put uh, so many people out of work. Mike McKee, awesome work. I'm looking forward to catching up with you through the next couple of days. Role reversal between Esther George and Neil Kashkari, right? Exactly. Last couple of weeks. I mean, What's that about? Yeah, and, and going back in the other way. Let's see where they uh, end up this time. You're coming up on China, Ender Curran, our Bloomberg chief. Emerging markets correspondent, very surely. This is Bloomberg. argument that they should, you know, hike well beyond 4%, 
Uh, and then uh, sort of that's the only way they're going to be able to rein in inflation. It doesn't make a lot of sense because if they do that, then there, there's a potential that, that things break. The economy in the U.S. is still is, is quite brittle. I think you'd make a very good Kansas City Fed president. I think you'd be fantastic at it. I think you should fill in that application form and, and go for it. Yeah, yeah but it's been, it's on, it was under thought last After the third martini last night, it was considered. Yeah. You start hallucinating. <laughs> hallucinating yeah. about what could be. We need to get back to square one you here. Think? And I thought that President George really nailed it. The things they're trying to do, it's not in the textbooks. They're, it's it's they, not easy. As Mike McKee said, their tool is to raise rates, and there's no other tool besides a job bonus. Tom, you've talked she about how the that. political pressure might turn the other way. Yes. The political pressure right now is get inflation down, get inflation down. You wonder how long that can hold, Lisa, if unemployment starts well, to climb. And yeah. if we start to see <clears> that going into the end of the year. The weakness that we have not seen yet, when does that create a more duality here of the labor market mandate and the inflation mandate for a Federal Reserve that only has one mandate right now? And I thought it was interesting that Esther George just emphasized the inflation. Price stability is the key to a strong economy, period, full stop. Will those two sides of that mandate, Tom, be in conflict by the end of the they've year? Always, they've been in conflict since McChesney Martin in 1951 when Harry Truman and he tried to figure out how to have an independent Fed, and that's part of the debate of an independent Fed. Let's remember that the former president would be apoplectic, President Trump, over this strong dollar. We're not hearing that from President We're Biden. We're not hearing it at all, actually. Yeah. And at the moment, I would say, actually, perhaps there are some people in Washington who would welcome the dollar strength we're seeing, because to some degree, it's helping. Just put a lid on inflation, some of that imported inflation. That's a luxury. <clears throat> We've said this a few times already this morning, so forgive me for repeating myself, but that's a luxury right. the UK and the Europeans don't have. But it shows how much the entire playbook of the past decade, of the past two decades, has been turned on its head. Flipped upside Complete down. Complete flipped upside down. So how, how about President Trump actually liking a, a strong dollar now versus the weak dollar then? No. I'm not going to go to the former president. It's more about a complete shift in the zeitgeist. And, of course, we'll have our coverage tomorrow. We're going to extend right through, and you will see the uh, speech of Chairman Powell here on radio and on television as well. This is an historic building, and whether it was built in 1955 or the visit of Lady Bird Johnson here were their first efforts of environment in the 60s, there's the reality of history being made. About 15 feet from Lisa Abramowitz is one of the most historic tables in international relations of America, a place where James Baker signed an agreement with the Soviet Union long ago. Those tensions stay, and they stay in China as well, and the current joins. Uh, always giving us good briefs from Hong Kong. And uh, I want you to describe the domestic tension that Beijing faces to jumpstart a 3% growth economy. So let me bring you up to speed on what happened today, Tom. Basically, the government has rolled out, or planning to roll out, about $150 US billion worth of stimulus. Now, this is going to be mostly spent on new infrastructure. It will go through the big policy banks, the government-owned banks taking stakes in these projects, and it will involve the local governments also ramping up their spending. Uh, now, however, the government did say at the same time that they don't want to go overboard with their spending. This is something of a divergence from the West because the Chinese government and authorities have been very critical of QE. They've been critical of the excess seen in the West when it came to responding to the pandemic. So even though their own economy now is slowing and they are putting more money into the system, into the, into the real economy, they're also saying that they're only going to go so far. They're not going all guns blazing or anything like it yet. And that's why economists today are saying that what they are doing really won't be enough. It won't be a game changer to keep things in and around that 3% area. And if I, could, if I could, just on the exchange rate, by the way, I heard Lisa talking about the dollar. China also seems to be favoring a strong yuan at the moment because it had been weakening it had been selling off in recent weeks, but this week the authorities have come in with a stronger fix in the daily, well, in the daily, in the daily fix, hinting that they want a stronger currency too. I need to rip up the script here. This is really important, folks, what Mr. Curran brings up, and this alludes to Jacob Frankel here at Jackson Hole. Is it a fixed currency, Enda? I mean, is there a delusion here that Yuan is floating? Well, it's obviously a managed currency, Tom. They do allow it to trade within a range, but ultimately the authorities have a lot of say over how far it can go in either direction in that range. Now, recently, the market had been pushing it down. It was weakening against the US dollar, less so against trade-weighted peers, but it had been weakening against the dollar. The thinking was, 
this is a policy lever for China. Maybe they're going to allow this to happen to uh, help the exporters. But we had a lot of commentary in the state press this week saying it's not a one-way bet, Yuan Weakness. And no sooner did that commentary appear, only we saw the authorities come in and set that daily fix a little bit stronger against the dollar. So just to your point about the kind of regime shift on, on currencies, it doesn't appear as though China is in a hurry to adopt a, or embrace a weaker currency either. And uh, right now, the PBOC is starting to get a little bit more aware of the pain that we see reflected, even in the official data. And the market is not really that enthused. People do not seem to believe that this is going to really generate confidence by consumers and businesses to go out and invest at a time when zero COVID is still really crimping the economy. And frankly, when industries are actually shutting down as a result of the drought and what that does to uh, power supplies in China, what are we looking at? If we look at the futility from the central bank, futility from central bank action, as well as policymakers, what does that mean about how much more pain the Chinese economy can have? So the response so far, Lisa, has been both piecemeal and, as you mentioned, it's not gaining traction. So that's why a lot of people are saying there's going to have to be a big pivot here somewhere. And does the pivot come on COVID zero? Now, obviously, there's been a big public health dividend from that, but clearly it's now dragging on the economy. So do they pivot on that? But the political messaging has been they will not pivot on that. State press this morning again saying you cannot lie flat in the battle against COVID. But then you look at real estate. What are they going to do there? This is a part of the economy that they could really jumpstart if they wanted to. Again, it's piecemeal. They are surely putting a floor under things. They are going to make whole those, those people who bought flats who haven't been finished. But we're not seeing any kind of a, a massive stimulus on the way that would totally rev up the construction and real estate sector. So a lot of people are asking, where is this... A turning point going to come for China's economy. It just seems to be barely crawling along into the end of the year, into the Congress. Maybe after Congress, we might reach some kind of a turning point. But so far, the signals are pretty cautious. And like I said on the stimulus announcement last night, they said they're putting money in, but they're not going to overdraw on it. Hey, Ender, thank you. Bloomberg's Ender Karen out of Hong Kong. <coughs> thank you, buddy, as always. This is the situation in China right now. We've gone over these numbers a few times for you. The forecast for China GDP. 3% if you're Goldman Sachs for this year. If you're Nomura, 2.8%. The forecast for Europe, a lot of people lining up to call a recession in the Eurozone economy. So for the Federal Reserve, Lisa, how many times have we asked this this week? And I think it's an important one for Fed presidents and the chairman alike. How do they navigate this? Well, how much momentum can the U.S. economy maintain in the face of what's going on overseas? Is this just a corporate profits issue, or does this go further to the core of what's driving growth in the U.S.? Can I pick up on a theme that you started with in this segment? Just how things have been turned upside down. We've gone from Max Dovish to Max Hawkish. We've gone from let's try and get inflation up to let's try and bring inflation back down. And we've gone from I really want a weaker currency to Jay, can I really have a stronger one? And right now, the Europeans haven't got one. It's a toxic brew. Is that brew. a toxic brew? <laughs> yes, and that's and often we, a toxic we, brew. we brought the road tang, folks. It's, that is uh, often a toxic brew. From Jackson Hole, <laughs> Mohamed El Arian, up next. Clearly, last year, the Fed was really off its mark. The Fed needs to unhitch their wagon from headline prices. They can't control that stuff. They can't control food or energy prices. Globally, inflation is a big concern, so they're going to have to factor that into how they look at the markets in the U.S. We're seeing wage growth 5% plus, and I think that that's really the issue for the Fed. I think they can bring inflation down to 25 or even 3%. The question, though, is can they keep it there? This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm just refusing to go outside until the sun comes up. I, I won't do this in the dark. <laughs> so we've got what? Bear another alert. Hour, another so hour. Hour. No, no, seriously, like there's <laughs> 200 bears in Jellystone and in Grand Teton. 200 okay. total, and Bear 39's got your number. Live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Thank you for that. For our audience <laughs> worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK, it's the annual get together, and once again, it's all about the chairman tomorrow. I just looked at $22 million seven bedrooms in Jackson Hole, 3,200 per square foot, and the comedy of the good Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City 
having their event at the richest real estate in the world, in America. John, it's insane how the two Americas here are identified at $3,200 per square foot. Are you suggesting this Fed might have a role to play with some of these real estate prices? I think this is important. We can talk to Dr. Larian about this. The partition of this nation coming off the creative finance under crisis 15 years ago, starting right here, 15 years ago, has led to that partition of 3,200 per square foot, seven bedroom, no, five bed, I stand corrected, <laughs> surveillance correction, five bedrooms, seven baths. Would you like to read out the description of the home you're looking he to buy? Well, did I that. toured it yesterday. Just, okay. No, no, I went through <laughs> it yesterday. That's what you were doing last night yeah. after two martinis. Anyway, okay, we caught up with Esther George <laughs> of the Kansas City Fed a little bit earlier this week, just yesterday. We played out some of that sound for you this morning. Here's what she had to say. We need to get rates higher to get demand down. How much pain are they willing to tolerate? It's going to be a big part of this annual get-together of this Federal Reserve. And what we have seen is they have not come out that dramatically to really say, we need to get inflation under control, full stop, regardless of the cost. That seemed to be where she was leaning. The balance was out, and it was much more price stability is the bedrock of any economic growth and any strong economy. That's change in tone for her, and I think that that's going to be reflected. Can you reconcile how this market has been priced over the last couple of months or so and the communication they're offering? How many times have you heard pivot, Fed pivot, from market participants? I don't ever hear that from Fed officials. What I want to hear, and Mohamed Alarian, I'm sure, will weigh in on this, does this reflect the lack of credibility that this Federal Reserve has with the market? The market saying, you guys are not understanding the weakness. We don't buy it. We know you're just trying to signal to us. But just wait. Next year, we're going to see that weakness trickle through. And we still, on the <clears> margins, <throat> believe well, in a transitory story. How much is that what we're going to hear? I talked to President George last night over a, a, a quiet dinner at the Pioneer Grill. And she's really considering getting a dog in Kansas okay. City. And she's going to name it Pivot. I actually they, they, heard you, you tell know. her that. No, no. There was no official comment no, on, no. on whether she was interested in calling that dog Pivot. I think, well, what, how do you pivot? And, you know, to get the Dr. Leary here for some data. 8.5% CPI. I think about how ridiculous this conversation is. 8.5% inflation I, in America. I, you're totally correct. And what's great is this next guest that we have, John, owns the thinking behind the game theory of something as silly as pivot. Let's get to that next guest right now. We're really happy to say that joining us is Mohammed Al Arian of Bloomberg Opinion and Queen's College, Cambridge, a man who, unlike this Fed chairman, <clears throat> called this, called this inflation spiral. Mohammed, <clears throat> let's go straight there. The challenge for this Fed chair at this annual Fed get-together, how big is it? It's huge, John, and good morning. It's huge because he's speaking to multiple audiences, as you pointed out, but it's also huge because he's got to deal with issues with respect to the past, the present, and the future. He's got to figure out how he's going to address his speech last year that proved so off the mark. He's got to figure out what to signal about current monetary policy. And let's not forget that we have a framework that is not fit for purpose. We have a policy framework fit for a world of deficient aggregate demand, and we are in a world for deficient aggregate supply. So put all this together. The challenge is very big, John. Mohammed, you're focused on a new word, stickiness, and you've been focused on that for a number of months now. From the incoming information, how sticky do you think that inflation dynamic is? And how much does that tell you about how much work this chairman still has to do? So I worry that core inflation is going to prove more sticky than the Fed anticipates right now. We have wages are starting to be a driver of higher <coughs> costs and eventually higher prices. So while headline inflation is going to continue to go down for the next two months, core may prove quite sticky, and that's a real problem for them. Mm -hmm. For those of you on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television, you just saw a little bit of light going out. That was one of the grizzly bears standing up and getting in the way of, of the light here. They're watching uh, here this morning as well. Dr. Alarian, people forget why you are Dr. Alarian, and it has to do with the acuity and uh, a concision of your game theory. You codified in the modern day the phrase T decision. Let's distill that down to the T decision that Chairman Powell has to make between now and a data busy September. And it's an important one, Tom, because right now the Fed is so late that it's looking at two challenges. It's looking at putting the inflation genie back into the bottle and it's looking at not creating too much damage to economic growth and inequality, something that you have been speaking to 
all morning. <clears throat> Look, I don't think he has any choice. He's got to put the inflation <clears throat> genie back into the bottle. You know, there's an old saying that macro stability isn't everything, right. but without it, you have nothing. So they've got to put that inflation genie back into the bottle and do it in a determined and sustainable fashion. Okay. But this is the politics of it, Dr. O'Leary. And if you have a partial differentiation from 8% U.S. inflation, the haves are benefited when you get to 6% or 5%. The have-nots, the great middle class, are still flat on their back. What is your timeline where all of America finally gets inflation back into the bottle? So it's going to take some time because the Fed has been asleep at the wheel. Um, and that's unfortunate. Tom, what you raise is, is much bigger. It is, speaks to the Fed being necessary but not sufficient to address our policy issues. Um, you've got to deal with the inequality aspect. You've got to protect the most vulnerable segments of the population with focused um, uh, fiscal policy. And you've got a lot to, to do a lot more on productivity and equal opportunity. So it's a long list. But the Fed has to focus on inflation and has to do it in a more committed fashion than it's done it so far. So it's been trying to sound, Mohammed, committed, right? I mean, they've basically been saying inflation is their number one issue that they're facing. Why is the market not hearing it? Two reasons, Lisa. One is the Fed itself. Let's not forget that Chair Powell hinted, not hinted, stated that we were at the neutral rate. The minute the market heard that, it moved, and it moved in a significant fashion, and all the talk about pivot started being amplified. So that's one reason that the communication hasn't been consistent, and that's been a problem for the last year. And the second issue is that the market is looking at the impact on growth, is looking at, this, at the potential impact on markets, and as John said earlier today, remembers the fourth quarter of 2018, remembers the Fed blinking, so it believes when push comes to shove, the Fed is going to blink again, that we're going to have a flip-flopping Fed. Mohammed, what I hear from you is that you don't think this Fed blinks anytime soon. I don't know, John. I know what they should do, which is they should not blink. Um, but I, it's been very difficult to call this Fed. This Fed has unfortunately failed at analysis, failed at forecast, failed at communication. So it's very difficult to say what this Fed is going to do. It's easier to say what it should do, but it's, mu it's much harder to say what it should, what it's going to do. And that's why you get this disconnect that you've been talking about between the markets and the Fed. Easier to find out what you think. So let's go there and wrap up this segment with you on what you think. Larry Summers called that neutral comment analytically indefensible. You said on neutral, and I think you were a little bit more diplomatic about it when we last spoke, you said the zip code for neutral was higher than where we are right now. Mohammed, what is the zip code for neutral, and how on earth do we know with inflation where it is and where rates where they are right now? So I don't know specifically where it is, and I've been warning against spurious precision. There are so many structural changes going on. We are changing liquidity regimes. I said earlier, we're going from a world of deficient aggregate demand to a world of deficient aggregate supply. That's the world we live in now. No one knows for sure where neutral is. So you've got to try to figure out as you go along the way. And you mustn't attempt this spurious precision, because if you do, the market is going to jump immediately to conclusions, and then you're going to have to undo it. You know, the Fed itself, Fed officials have walked back that comment. It didn't take many days for other Fed officials to come out and say, we're not at neutral. Mohammed, it's great to catch up with you. I'm pleased to say you're going to be sticking with us for another 15 minutes. Mohammed oh, Hilarion. I didn't know that. Mohammed in Wonderful. New York when we're not in New York. Have you noticed that? Over. Yeah. Have you noticed that? He's Are they over. going to cut off the, the, the line to us? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think he's from speak. Cambridge, he's on sabbatical, actually. He's, he's on sabbatical. That, yeah. How long for? He was there for three months, so they gave him a one year sabbatical. There we go. Work it's 6 like 10 that. local time here in Jackson Hole, and you can probably hear the cafe behind us starting to set up, well, TK. This as is the Fed president slowly wake up. This is the research that we do here at Bloomberg Surveillance, and what's so important important about this is what has changed here in the last eight months. After a raging debate of five or six years, Wyoming has allowed for roadkill. If you see something in the road, you can now legally p pull it I'm up. I'm sorry. And, and <laughs> it's six, is that the extent John, of your research? Five that, months that, ago. Yeah, well, listen, this is important. Is five it, months ago, it, Wyoming 511 is an app you pick up where you communicate. So this morning here, 
at the meetings of the Kansas City Is Fed. This real? We've got elk, okay. bison, and a tourist from New Jersey. This is the benefit of a three anchor <laughs> program. If one of us doesn't do any real work, the other two can try and pick up the slack. Are you serious? No, I'm serious. Yeah. Roadkill. It's a British idea. You could do no, this outside of British London. Idea. You could have London roadkill. Christian Mamani is coming up a little bit later of Lafayette College. He's not going to be talking oh. about roadkill. And neither and is Mohammed Al Arian. The squirrel. Oh, you know, last night, I had no. a squirrel last Stop night it. on the way up. Stop I'm it. Stop it. From Jackson Hole. <laughs> Are you done? This You're is done. true. You're so done. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> We're going to talk about Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Kansas City Fed President Esther George says the central bank has to get interest rates higher in order to bring down inflation. She spoke to Bloomberg TV at the Jackson Hole. We'll see which tweet. We have more room to go. That we would bring those rates down quickly, and I've seen that in some of the forecasts, seems a bit remarkable to me. I think o we over, will have to hold. Over 4%? Um, it could be well over, it could be over 4%. I don't think that's out of the question. But again, you won't know that, I think, until you begin to watch the data signs. George says it's important that the Fed is clear about where it is headed. Citigroup is joining those companies that have closed operations in Russia since the invasion of Ukraine. City will wind down its Russian consumer and commercial banking units after a sale stalled. The company will incur $170 million on costs tied to the exit. In Uvalde, Texas, the school board has fired the school police chief following that mass shooting in which 19 fourth graders and two teachers died. An investigation described Pete Arredondo as the commander responsible for police response. Law enforcement waited outside the school for more than an hour whilst the gunman was inside. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. It's very important that we are clear in our communication about the destination we're headed. And I think that destination is important, which is we have to get interest rates higher to slow down demand and bring inflation back to our target. That was Esther George, the Kansas City Fed president, live from Jackson Hole this morning. Good morning to you all. Alongside Lisa Abramitz and Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures just about positive, up six tenths of one percent on the S&P 500 TK as we gear up for a big couple of days ahead at Jackson Hole. Big couple of days ahead again under that speech tomorrow, and we're really thinking about the theory and the underpinnings of our monetary system. But that system is not just the United States. It's a global system. And now with us, we continue with Mohammed Alarian writing for Bloomberg Opinion and far more with an international economic and financial perspective for his University of Cambridge. Dr. Alarian, I want to go to the international tone here, uh, central banker of the world. And the singular feature I have is the focus is on Plaza Accord like partners when there is EM. Forget about idiosyncratic. Turkey out over 18 lira. What will be the shock of Powell action to a more fragile emerging market uh, in third world economies? It's a high risk situation, Tom. You have higher rates, so more uncertain market conditions. You have global economic growth slowing much faster than most people expected, and you have a stronger dollar. Historically, that has not been a favorable mix for, for emerging economies. So right now, how much does this bleed back to the U.S. economy? How do you bleed through the pain that you're seeing in Europe, in China, into slowing U.S. growth and entering a recession? You know, Lisa, the quick and easy is to say that everybody has an inflation problem, everybody has a growth problem. And that's true. But go further, we have massive dispersion. Um, Growth, the U.S. is in a much better place than most other countries. Central bank policy, if we think that the Fed faces tough challenges, look at the ECB. Not only do they have high inflation, they have a much more fragile economy and they have the risk of fragmentation. So I think the theme going forward is going to have a strong element of dispersion come into it. And that makes markets have to spend a lot more time 
thinking about relative values and not just the overall beta, if you like. When you take a look at the framework, policymakers are starting to think more about a structural inflation that will last a much longer time due to deglobalization and due to the sort of structurally higher commodity costs. The market is not buying it. They are still betting on some sort of return to what we've experienced over the past few decades. We know that, uh, Mohammed, you err on the structural side. You say that's probably where we're going. What will it take for the markets to wake up to that reality? And how violent is that pivot? It's going to take time. Um, you know, I'm a buyer of the notion that we are changing macro regimes. As I said earlier, from deficient aggregate demand to deficient aggregate supply. You pointed out to the Wall Street Journal article earlier that listed three reasons why supply is going to be a challenge in the next few years. Globalization, deglobalization, et cetera. So we are in a different regime. I think the economists recognize this. I think the Fed officials semi-recognize this. Markets are still in a cyclical mindset. And it's the mindset that has served them well. So it's going to take some time and it's going to take persistence on the part of central banks to try and convince markets that they have to think structurally and not just cyclically. So, Mohammed, with that in mind, what are the characteristics of this new market regime? What do you think the defining characteristics are and will be? I think resilience is going to be the key issue, John. I think you've got to have resilient names in your portfolios, whether it's in credit, whether it's in equities. Um, and resilience means balance sheet, means management teams. Resilience is going to be the most important element to help you navigate this world. Can we talk about the resilience of Europe and finish there? We touched on that at the start of this segment. You talked about the difficulty of the ECB. European gas prices are up by 6.5% again today, Mohammed. I still don't think we fully realise how tough things could be in Europe later this year. Do you sense the same thing from the people you speak to? And can you frame how bad do you think this is going to be later this year? It's going to be hard. Um, it's going to be a cost of living crisis. You see it already in the UK and you see the reaction in the UK much earlier than you're seeing it in continental Europe. And on top of that, there's going to be massive demand destruction going on. So Europe is looking at a tough six to nine months. I, like some others that have been on your show, don't see how Europe escapes recession. I hate saying that, but the outlook is one of a recessionary economy, and let's hope it's shallow and <clears throat> short. Uh, uh, Mohammed, Augustin Karstens of Mexico, now general manager of the Bank of International Settlements, has published today in the FT with Chris Giles. It's an extremely important piece about our behavior, our individual game theory with higher inflation. What is the when where we begin to embed high inflation behavior? Are we there now, or does it wait for next year? So it depends who we are. Um, if you are the striking um, ports uh, um, workers in the UK or underground workers, you're there. You're already there. Your inflationary expectations have changed. You want to protect your standard of living. It's only a matter of time until they seek not only to, to protect against past erosion in purchasing power, but also future erosion in, in purchasing power. So you're there. In, in the US, you're not there yet. Um, but slowly, you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And well, what we're going to find, Tom, and I know you know that, in terms of game theory, is that initial conditions vary tremendously. Some workers and some <clears> companies <throat> are going to be able to protect their margins, yeah. to protect their purchasing powers. Others will not. Mohammed, wonderful to catch up with you. Are you getting comfortable in Tom's seat over there? I am. Would I love like the microphone. It's a bit cold, though, I must say. It's colder here than it is where you are. <laughs> There you go. Mohamed al out of New York today. Mohamed, thank you. Just absolutely brilliant, as you always are. Mohamed, with us over the last 30 minutes or so. TK, some difficult issues that we'll stay on top of. This is what it's about. Howard Davies, 10 days ago in The Guardian, uh, and what we just saw in the FT with Augustine, Augustine Karstens. And this is, an, this is an elite, unique elite feature of Americans. We think we're different. 8% inflation won't become embedded. Baloney. Elisa, essentially, that's the theme you were 
really getting out with Mohammed moments ago. Well, and this is partly because all of what we saw in the 1990s, some people are saying it's going into reverse. The whole idea of finding cheaper labor elsewhere and then importing the disinflation from that. The whole idea of commodity prices being plentiful. People saying that because there hasn't been an investment in a lot of these commodity complexes and the real stuff that we use, it is going to be more expensive for a longer period of time. I remember time. something Joe Weissenthal said in the last couple of years, and it stuck with me because I think it's so important. Basically alluded to the idea that the real bubble in the last 10 years was in the labor market. It was cheap labor. And that's burst, and now all these companies have got to try and adjust to that. That's something to think about. Well, especially because we're seeing productivity go down, wages go up, and we're getting the same okay. thing for it. And that's been a real problem for the Federal Reserve. How do they then reshape we, what their narrative is? We should bring Joe Weisenthal here next year with Tracy. Joe can bring yes. his guitar and his band, and they can set up in the bar and, and they play can do an some, episode of Odd Lots. Flying Burrito Brothers Downstairs. and all that. Very that's cool. Brilliant. Jay Bryson and Wells Fargo coming right up. This. It's Bloomberg. Live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming this morning. Good morning to you. The annual Fed get together with Chairman Powell addressing the market, the world and this economy tomorrow morning at 8 local, 10 a.m. Eastern time. We've got some economic data coming out very shortly. Let's touch base with Mike McKee for a little bit more. Hey, Mike. Good morning, John. We're waiting for the numbers to cross right now. I thought you were sending me down here to do a weather report, and I can tell you the rain just started to let up. So maybe you guys can come down and join me here in a few moments. Jobless claims coming out this morning, and uh, I'm losing my connection here, but I'll uh, get the numbers for you in just a second here. Uh, initial jobless claims coming out for last week, and it is kind of crazy because uh, the elements are conspiring against us here. Uh, I, uh, John, if you have the number in front of you, you can go ahead and give that because uh, I, I, yeah. I don't know why moment. we made you do yeah, this, this in the pouring so rain <laughs> outside in Jackson Hole. Mike, forgive me for that. 243K. Yeah. Is, this, is that the theme tune for this market check yeah, or this data is. check? Okay. 243K is where claims come in. So that's a drop from the previous number of 250. The estimate was it's 252. A that's a better number. Yeah. It's a better number on jobless <laughs> claims at 243. Mm -hmm. Personal consumption leads are in at 1.5% for the second quarter. This is the extra read we're getting here. The GDP price index at 8.9%. That's what I'm putting in. Core PCE quarter on quarter wow. at 4. 4%. Well, but to me, the fact that the price index for the second read of second quarter GDP was revised upward tells you something about I, I where agree. the price pressure is. Yeah. To me, all of a sudden, that starts to raise a question about where we end the year. What happens if we end the year at 8% CPI? What does that do for Fed yeah. policy? Annualized GDP quarter on quarter negative 0.6%. The estimate negative 0.7%. Yeah. Some of the data points. I think Mike McKee's still with us. So, Mike, since we just got you drenched in the pouring yeah. rain to look at that economic data, <laughs> I hope you heard what I just said, and you can respond to it. Well, I, I think at this point the uh, the issue has been what is the economy actually doing because of this whole question about two uh, consecutive quarters of contraction. So uh, we have a, a, a way to rethink about it. Now, the big issue is going to be going into the third quarter, what do we see so far? The consensus seems to be we're at about 1.3 percent GDP growth, which would be a rebound. Uh, you got people all over the place, though. You still have some economists saying that we could see a uh, another contraction. And uh, you got a guy like Ian Shepardson at Pantheon who says we could see 5 percent growth in the third quarter. We're going to need to see a bit of a uh, a bit of a change before we get to, to that. But uh, that's going to be key. And range. the fact that jobless claims are falling a little bit, that, that's not bad. Uh, I mean, it still suggests some strength in the labor market, which the Fed is counting on to be able to raise rates. Mike, we'll take that. It's better news. Mike McKee, <clears throat> thank you, sir. Outside in the pouring rain. <laughs> Lisa, any price action off the back of that? Not much. I mean, it's pretty muted, but you are seeing two-year yields lift just a touch. And really, to Mike's point, the fact that you're not seeing the weakness in the labor market and that you're seeing price pressures that are revised upward in the backwards look at GDP shows the urgency for the Fed to move. So that's why we're seeing uh, that front end continue to hang in there and even rise higher. TK, we'll take some better news, won't we? 243. It, we'll yeah, take that. We'll, yeah, we'll take the Yes, I think it's important, but it's one data point in high-frequency data. And we have to remember everyone here is fixated on monthly and, indeed, quarterly data. And the high-frequency data for Fed officials, I think, gets in the way. I'm looking forward to the ISM. 
in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, you taught me this. The, I was the not PMI, a big fan. The yeah. PMI dreadful. was dreadful. And we've kind of shaken it off because, and excuse me, S&P Global, because this is not a dig. I think that market participants have shaken it off because it's S&P Global and they prefer here in the United States to look at the ISM. Well, and it hasn't been as reliable. It hasn't been as correlated with the official ISM as, uh, as other indicators have been. That said, the peripheral read is that you are seeing a material slowdown, and it's not just the manufacturing. It's also in the services. That was what really struck me, and you're seeing that in the earnings as well. Will it be confirmed by the ISM, Tom, in the next couple of weeks? And then we've got another payrolls report. We've got another CPI report mm -hmm. before we even begin to well, really think about September 21 with a full set of data in front of us. Let's meld the data in as we go to September here. And this, of course, off what we've seen, uh, off what we see, I should say, with the speech tomorrow. Jay Bryson joins us. He's with Wells Fargo. He's chief economist and with an international carriage there but of a, comp of a company, a bank, with acute micro-analysis of the American economy. Jay, dovetail your international view with your domestic view right now. How close are we to recession? Well, you know, right now, um, Tom, I, you know, I think that we're, we're not in a recession right now. I mean, the, the big indicator I would look at is what you folks have just been talking about. That's the labor market. It doesn't seem to be falling apart, certainly at this point. But I think, you know, later this year, early next year, that's when we think you're going to start to see a modest recession. It's, you know, inflation remains high. What we have seen is real disposable income has trended down. That's another way to say that is purchasing power. And right. credit card mm -hmm. debt is up. Savings rate is down, and we think eventually consumers are going to hit the wall here, and they're going to start to retrench, and that puts us into a, let's call it a modest recession, beginning of next year. Jay, I've got to go to the franchise, which is Wells Fargo Economics, and of course that dovetails with your housing expertise. Give us an update on housing inflation and rental inflation in America. Yeah, so Tom, so the way that enters into um, into the you know the, the GDP numbers or the CPI numbers, I should say, is it comes in with quite a long lag. And I mean, what we are seeing is we are seeing some softening in house prices. We are starting to see some softening a little bit in terms of rental uh, prices as well. But that's going to remain coming in with a long, long lag. And so that's one of the reasons why we continue to believe that you know the core PCE deflator or the core CPI um, index, the year-over-year rates are going to remain relatively elevated. And so, you know, Lisa was talking about so the, uh, you know, the, co the core PCE deflator earlier. We think at the end of this year, you're still looking at a year over year rate of five and a half, or sorry, four and a half percent. So what does that mean for next year? And this is, I think, where the market would disagree with you or disagree with some and say, well, it's going to then come down really quickly, that the year over year comparison effects are going to take, it, uh, take effect and you're going to see a real deceleration in inflation. Do you agree or are you looking at something much closer to the Jan Hatzius stickier inflation that the Fed could hold rates higher for longer for? Well, so, so first of all, uh, uh, we do believe the core PCE inflation rate is going to come down next year, but that's predicated on our view of a recession. Right? You know, once you get a recession, you start to get softness in, in uh, prices. If we don't have a recession, if consumers continue to go out there and spend, we don't have the recession, then we don't think the core PCE um, inflation comes down as fast as we generally think. And also, in terms of the Fed, uh, you know, generally when you see a recession, at least in history, they start to cut pretty, pretty quickly. We think they're going to hold the, you know, the Fed funds rate constant at four to, you know, four and a quarter, or say, through, say, the middle part of next year, just to make sure that inflation is coming back towards their 2% target. So I don't think the Fed comes running to the rescue as soon as we start to see the economy tipping over into recession. And they keep saying they're data dependent, and we keep asking, what data are they looking at? But I want to ask you about the messiness of that data, because last year we got labor market data that really underestimated just how much strength there was, how much demand for uh, labor. What's your view on what we're getting wrong now? Which data is distorted that we're going to look back and say, if only we had gotten a little bit clearer picture? 
Well, Liz, I think the thing that we may be getting wrong right now may be the labor market. I mean, you know, so we're, we're getting mixed signals there. You know, if you look at the ISM numbers that you folks were talking about, you know, just recently, we're, we've seen some real softness over the last few months in terms of the ISM sort, uh, sort of numbers. Uh, you know, the birth death model, um, you know, which is a technical sort of thing, that may be pushing up the reported non-farm payroll numbers right now. So I think maybe we're getting some of the labor market data wrong. I'm sure the people at the Fed are crunching through all those numbers right now. But that would be the thing I think I would, I would really right. look at. Jay, you're a student of history, and I want to go to a, a marvelous effort by the FT today and their Colby Smith on the 40, 50-year history of the Fed. Has there been any time in the span of the half century or in this Fed right now where they're really addressing the Americans outside the financial elite and outside the financial system? Is it just talk or are they actually doing something new in 2022? Well, so let's go back to 2019, Tom, when they first started to take a more broader view of, of the labor market, you know, different ethnic groups and things like that. So that, that certainly is, is, is true. I mean, and, and I think what they are doing now is they're looking more than outside this, the financial elite. I mean, we all know that inflation um, affects everybody in the economy. It, it arguably affects lower income Americans more than it does higher um, income sort of Americans. So, you know, I do believe they are taking a very, very broad, expansive view just outside of the financial elite. You know, they're, they're focused on inflation right now. They seem to have committed to want to bring that inflation rate down. And if it does, that will bring some financial relief to um, lower classes of Americans. Jay Bryson of Wells Fargo. Jay, thank you, sir. Looking ahead to a lot of economic data over the next few weeks as we anticipate a speech from Chair Powell on Friday tomorrow and then a big decision from the Federal Reserve on September 21. Do you want a sneak peek of payrolls on September 2nd? Here's the estimates so far. 295K. I did not know that. 295. Thank you. That's like a, all, the early... estimates, all the estimates aren't in yet, as you know, but 295 is the median estimate right now, Lisa. Yeah, but we keep hearing how wrong people are getting the labor market. That, that, and we just heard Jay Bryson there say, perhaps when we look back, that's going to be the one area that we're still getting wrong. And when you just anecdotally go around, how many hiring uh, signs do you see? I mean, even the Kansas City Fed. But, I mean, beyond well, this that... this is the bull case. Take case going. <laughs> this is the bull <laughs> case. Exactly. The Kansas City but, Fed. but really, everywhere is like we want to hire people this is the bull case and what's so important john and i were looking at why dr bryson was talking at the irish times where there's a surging irish employment just as one anecdote as well and you see it with claims and to, to say the number again john I 295 295 295 is the jobs number for a couple of weeks time you're looking at claims 10 jacks and holes 250. ago 150 was normal and we're popping 295 it's a terrible economy. Claims right now 243. It, it's terrible. Just to clean that out. It's terrible. Have, have you looked outside? Are we going outside? It's gloomy. Is this a game time decision? It, 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 we got to figure this out. Whether we go people outside. outside, optimistic people inside. All right, I think we're heading outside. You know what really pierced <laughs> that bearish debate? It's that payrolls number north of 500. Yeah. That just blew it up. Yeah. Krishna Romani of Lafayette College is going to be with us and, to guide you into the opening <clears throat> ball alongside Megan Green of the Kroll Institute and Savita Subramanian oh, of Bank of America as well. You looking forward to that? Yeah, I am looking Good. forward to a huge social response to President George naming your new dog Pivot. Huge response. Hey, can you just confirm huge. that that's not true? No, oh, it's I, true. I, I, no, she told me. We'll confirm that it's Live not true. Live from Jackson Hole. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world for the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. President Biden's plan to forgive a portion of student loans held by tens of millions of people will ripple through the economy, but no factor will be more closely watched than inflation. Bloomberg Economics sees the potential to add as much as two tenths of a percentage point to the inflation rate next year. That comes at a time when inflation is already at a four decade high. UBS says the euro area has already entered a shallow recession triggered by surging energy prices. Economists at the Swiss bank predict the 19-nation economy will shrink by one-tenth of one percent in the third quarter and two-tenths of a percent in the fourth. Power prices set records today in both Germany and France. And for the first time in a month, global monkeypox cases have declined. According to the World Health Organization, new cases around the world fell 21% in the week that ended Sunday. Dwindling caseloads in Europe offset a continued spike in the Americas. There's still growing concerns about a supply crunch for vaccines. 
And China is taking steps to support the yuan after it hit a two-year low against the dollar. The People's Bank of China set its yuan reference rate at a stronger-than-expected level. That's seen as a sign signal the central bank wants to slow the pace of the currency's depreciation. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I know what they should do, which is they should not blink, um, but I, it's been very difficult to call this Fed. This Fed has unfortunately failed at analysis, failed at forecast, failed at communication. So it's very difficult to say what this Fed is going to do. It's easy to say what it should do, and that's why you get this disconnect that you've been talking about <clears throat> between the markets and the Fed. Mohammed Alarian there of Queens College, Cambridge, visiting our New York studios as we visit Wyoming. It is the meetings of the Kansas City Fed. We welcome all of you on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television. Some years more quiet, more academic. That is not the case. This fractured 2022, the chairman's speech tomorrow, and as well, the discussions happening right now this Thursday as the sun comes up across uh, the wonderful Tetons. What we're going to do is drive forward the conversation for you. We're going to stay with you in the next hour. We'll, uh, and tomorrow, we'll go even further on with a live broadcast, first time of the Fed chairman from this uh, Kansas City Fed. But right now, we take what we heard from Mohammed Alarian and synthesize it into Bank of America economics and foreign exchange strategy. We do that with Thanos Van Vakitis, global head of G10 FX strategy at the bank. Thanos, thank you so much for joining us and briefing us yeah. on strong dollar. The zeitgeist is at some point the dollar moves the other way. When do we see dollar weakness? What are the conditions that will allow for a dollar weak? It's quite simple, honestly. The dollar has strengthened so much because of high inflation, particularly in the U.S., and the hawkish Fed. So we need the Fed to start being more concerned about growth than about inflation for the dollar to start weakening. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say that the dollar will get even stronger because it is at a 20-year high, but I would expect it to remain strong because I think we are still far from a situation in which the Fed will feel comfortable having inflation under control and start being right. concerned about growth. Thanos, to work off of Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank, who joined us a few hours ago here to begin our, our coverage, Alan Ruskin is looking at flows. Let's take Switzerland, which is, as we know, always overwhelmed by money coming in and ever stronger Swiss franc. Is America being overwhelmed by flows coming in, which is supporting the dollar, harming the degrees of freedom that Chairman Powell has? Not necessarily. We do see investors buying the dollar, but nowhere uh, as much as one would have expected, given the very strong dollar rally. Usually at these levels of the dollar, we have expected a market that would be long and stretched on the dollar. That's not the case. Actually, before this dollar started, uh, uh, rally started, the market was short the dollar, so these positions got squeezed. And maybe now some indicators suggest a slightly long dollar position. But we have not seen the flows that one would have started being concerned that the position mm -hmm. is a constraint for the dollar and you can get a position in a squeeze. Definitely, however, if you get a relaxing of financial conditions because of a strong rally in risk sentiment, this does make the job of the Fed more difficult. One of the partitions we see, Thanos, is a present president of the United States who has been very quiet on dollar dynamics. The previous president was very strident about the harmful effects of strong dollar. Can Bank of America document that American business is harmed by a strong dollar? Not necessarily. Although the dollar is strong, it is fully consistent with fundamentals. It has to do with the fact that the U.S. economy 
has recovered from the pandemic much stronger than the rest of the world. And the U.S. economy has been overheating. The labor market is extremely tight. So it is hard to argue that the dollar has overshot. It is more like the economy has been doing very well, too well actually, and the dollar has appreciated, rather than the strong dollar that is hurting the economy. Uh, so from this point of view, the right. strong dollar is not really a concern at this point. The concern is inflation. Athanas, very quickly here, if I want to be opportunistic into Q3, what is a trade you recommend where I can make a number of big figure points? I would say keep buying the dollar dips. I wouldn't necessarily say to buy the dollar at this level, but whenever you get the opportunity and you get the dollar dip, buy it, because I do believe that for the rest of the year the dollar will remain strong. Thanos, thank you so much. Thanos Van Vakitis of Bank of America, of course, there on the, the, the depth of the system, what the dollar uh, means as well. Let me do a data check here and bring in Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. It's very important to do the data here with the sun rising across Jackson Lake. And the data check is that we've seen three elk this morning. We think a bear in the distant and far more importantly, the majesty of four <laughs> eagles flying from the south up to Jellystone <laughs> Park uh, earlier on. So joining us from outdoors, away from the roadkill, John Farrow. Hey, TK, the first thing someone said to me about two minutes ago was, is TK too scared of the rain? Is he staying indoors and missing the next hour of programming? I'm told you're coming down here, Tom. And as we go towards that opening bell, we need to really set up what markets are preoccupied with going into Chairman Powell. Lisa, after the rally we've had over the last couple of months, excluded what's happened in the last couple of weeks, we've all been asking the same question, whether what we've seen is an unwarranted easing of financial conditions. So how does the Fed push back against that at a time when they've tried to, uh, but not with the conviction, perhaps, that people need to hear? And Mohamed Alarian was brilliant on this. Their message has been inconsistent. So what will it take for the, for the markets to hear the message they want to be sending right now? And TK, you've said it a million times. CPI right now at 8.5 percent it's about where we land near year end seven six five four and then what how sticky is this well, going to be and how long do they need to raise and hold for because this conversation about rate cuts is not a conversation <clears throat> that the officials here are having the and what's so important here in a topic for jason Furman tomorrow is the social partition of a disinflation the haves clicking in with benefit at six, five, even four percent. The have nots crushed until we get down to a certain level. John, what is that level? And will, or will Jerome Powell define tomorrow a new non two percent level? Elisa, you know better than most. For economists, it's good versus bad. For market participants, it's better or worse. And that's what we need to have a conversation about as well. We all know that things in China aren't great. We know that things in Europe are pretty ugly right now. And we know in the United States we're going to have some difficulties later this year. Is that better or worse relative to what we expected a couple of months ago? And I'll take it a step further. Is the better than expected in the U.S., meaning that the Fed has to be harsher than expected when it comes to trying to penalize and remove some of that froth? Do they serve hot drinks out here? Well, so over happening? here, over here, we hear the rain puddles being pushed out from around us. And in there, we hear the uh, clatter of the cafe. A TK enjoying his latte. <laughs> you know? Exactly, the warm latte. Doing hot drinks out here? I don't think so. Mike McKee's here with a cowboy hat looking around. No. Not with hot drinks. Not serving any hot drinks. <laughs> no. <at all. laughs> okay. We can get on that. Krishna Mamani is going to be joining us from Lafayette College in about five minutes' time. We'll hear from Megan Green and we'll hear from Savita Subramaniam around the opening bell as well. From Jackson Hole, Wyoming this morning. Good morning. This is an extended edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. The countdown to the Open starts right now with about 30 minutes until the Open in Bow Bramo. And the main event, you know the main event, don't you? We're here. It's Chairman Powell tomorrow. Clearly, and how much is he going to signal a pushback to markets that have gotten carried away with this idea of a pause or some sort of shift from the hawkishness that we've heard over the past uh, a few months? Has TK made it? Uh, he's, I've got he's a sighting. Over there. I see a sighting. It's like sighting a grizzly. <laughs> TK's down <laughs> an here, elk. ready to get an elk. The, grills, the grizzlies that. don't really Say like Say what you want, he can't hear us. Yeah. <laughs> Let's begin with a big issue. Kicking off, Jackson Hole.
really very much in anticipation of um, what we're going to hear from Jackson Hole. It's a momentous time in the economy. There is this risk of more hawkish rhetoric. I worry that at Jackson Hole, uh, Powell will state the obvious. They really haven't won the inflation battle yet. Their battle is against inflation. It may bring recession. Jackson Hole disappoints. Risk assets are still quite at risk for a hard landing. You could get another one of those 10% sell-offs. Further downside risk. Recession. They are going to have to come in on Friday and take the opportunity really to reset investor expectations. All lives right now are going to be on uh, J-PAL. Joining us now to kick things off is Krishna Mamani of Lafayette College. Krishna, let's start right here. Are expectations a little bit too high from some market participants on what we should expect, can expect, from the chairman tomorrow? Well, so if you, if you think about it from uh, uh, Chair Powell's perspective, what is it that the, he can say that would be very different from what he has already said 15 times over? The, the, I think uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a place where we are waiting for new data to really discern which way the Fed is going to do, or uh, Fed is going to go, we are trying to make stuff up at the moment. I don't expect anything significant coming out of the Jackson Hole. If, he may say the same things, and the market may interpret it as more hawkish because that's the, the, the way the market is positioned at the moment. But Krishna, you're the perfect person to join us right now because you're not taking a short-term view or even a medium-term view. You have to take a long-term view with allocations in a pension with an endowment. And how much are you looking at a changed regime that the markets have not yet woken up to, akin to Mohammed Alarian, looking at a more protracted, embedded inflation that forced the Fed's hand and forced the Fed's rate up higher for longer? Well, no, that's, uh, that's uh, from, for long-term investors, that's really the, the, the key point. The question is, are we going to get into an inflationary regime that is dramatically, and the key word here is dramatically different than what has been the case for a while? So if we are talking about inflation being not at, uh, let's say, not at one, one and a half percent where we have been and two and a half percent for long term investors, does that change the outlook dramatically? The, I guess the point I'm trying to make is right now it looks really scary, but I, I, one can debate whether inflation is going to go up or not. Uh, but the magnitude of that the uptrend in inflation is far more important than whether it is going to go up or not. And our belief remains that uh, over time, things will start uh, calming down once we come out of the current uh, uh, inflationary episode. The inflation may be higher, but the drivers are not there for it to be meaningfully higher. Okay, so Krishna, you're taking the other side of that and going back to the old playbook eventually. How much do you look to some of the academic research that's going to be presented at this conference or some of the indicators that the Fed officials are honing in on to potentially change that view? Well, so, you know, it, it, would, be, uh, it would be interesting to hear what sort of data that they are looking at to drive policy. But I don't think I'm, I'm expecting to hear anything dramatic in terms of uh, new research that would that would suggest that the inflation regime has changed so much that investors have to dramatically change their outlook with respect to where the returns are going to come from. For endowments, for pension plans, people who are counting on uh, their portfolios to provide significant amount of returns, I think the outlook is still very much for equities over the next 5, 10, 20 years to provide the bulk of your returns, and that's how we will be positioned. Mike McKee alongside us this morning. And Mike, great to have you with us. I want to begin with the conversation you had with Esther George of the Kansas City Fed and proving that central bankers can just speak quite clearly sometimes. We need to get rates up and demand down. It's that simple. Yeah, the Fed's only tool is to raise interest rates to get demand down. They can't do anything about the supply side. I think Krishna nailed it. There isn't going to be much new from Jay Powell because they've said all along they're committed to fighting inflation. It's just that uh, what's happened is we're getting such conflicting signals about the economy that it feeds the narrative we could be going into a recession or everything could be fine. This morning, we got some data that just makes their job more complicated because GDP, uh, this, the first revision of it shows that uh, we were down six-tenths of a percent, which is an improvement from nine-tenths. But gross domestic income reported for the first time today rose 
four tenths. Now those should be the same thing because one person's sale is another person's buy, but they are going in different directions. So which one is telling the true story of the economy? Well, inconsistent data, and also if Mohamed Al Arian is correct, inconsistent Fed messaging, right? And that's been part of the problem and the lack of credibility of their saying, "Look, we've got to be hawkish. We have one mandate, very clear," as John was saying. So. Do you think that there has been a real shifting under their belt, under their uh, their feet, in terms of their approach, and how do they regain that that belief, that credibility? Well, the big shift was when they went away from forward guidance and said we're going to be meeting by meeting, data driven, because they really have to be at this point because all the data look backwards, and so they're trying to divine what's going to happen. They can't tell you like they did before what's going to happen, and that's a real problem for them now. Uh, I don't think they're as divided as people think because 50 basis points and 75 basis points are both big moves. And until this year, there had only been three of those in the last 50 years of each. So the idea that you're debating 50 and 75. No, uh, laughing. You're laughing because they didn't. Why am really I laughing? Get, because, you didn't, laughing? because you didn't. They didn't get rid of uh, four you're, guidance. You're a mind reader. <laughs> That's, is that not what you're That's exactly what I was going to go. go. <laughs> okay. How did they address <laughs> the big division in this market right now between the market and Federal Reserve? officials, which is the Federal Reserve is talking about tightening more and market participants are pricing in rate cuts. How do you address that without offering a form of forward guidance? Well, I think they, they are offering a form of forward guidance to the point that they say we are going to raise rates until we see inflation coming down. But how much and when, that's the part that they have now taken out of their guidance. And the problem is nobody really knows. Markets are making a bet, but market bets change all the time. And we were just talking about this last night. Uh, the idea of what the Fed is going to do in September 21st, the markets are priced exactly between 50 and 75 because they don't know what the jobs report is going to say in the CPI report. They're ready to go either way. I don't think Powell changes things so much as the way the economy develops. It's about the incoming information. So, Krishna, let's talk about the incoming information. Do you think the two sides of this mandate will be more in conflict as we approach year end? Well, I, I think so. I think the economy, U.S. economy in general, is slowing down and slowing down quite rapidly. And in that sort of a, a, a context, uh, the Fed has to uh, decide which is a bigger priority at the moment, uh, especially in light of the fact that uh, forward expectations uh, uh, or uh, market expectations with respect to inflation really has been re-anchored. So that's that's the context that they are dealing with in a in, in an environment where the current uh, uh, current outlook for inflation is still pretty uh, pretty high and the economy is slowing down. There, there are trade-offs to be made. And one can make a good case that the trade-off they'll make is, well, they will err on the side of being more conservative and stick with the policy a lot longer than what the market is expecting. And the market will adjust accordingly. I think Mike McKee made the critical point. It's not that the Fed is being inconsistent or they are saying different things. They have been saying the same thing. That is, inflation is their priority. They will continue to focus on it until it comes down. The real question is, what would the data show up uh, in over the next few quarters, if, if, and would that data change their opinion? It's really not about what they're saying. Well, except that there is a, a slight problem here, which is the transmission mechanism for them is in financial conditions. And I think about what Stephen Major over at HSBC says. He has to predict how other people are going to respond to data and then what that's going to do to the longer-term ramifications and, uh, and, and, and longer-term action. How much does an ongoing rally in equities actually cause the Fed to go more aggressively and signal more vociferously that they are going to crimp down on inflation in a much more hard-handed way? That's a, that's a very good point. The, the one issue that I would take is this market obsession with respect to financial conditions uh, based on equities is somewhat misplaced. From a growth perspective, uh, for, especially for an economy like the U.S., what matters more is really the uh, the credit markets and credit creation for the private sector, and you know clearly that is uh, that has certainly loosened up, and that's something that the Fed has to worry about. But ha the the question for the Fed really is: Has it loosened up uh, too much relative to what the forward-looking data uh, is is looking like? And I think that's the question the market has to debate over the next over the, over the rest of the year. I, again, as I said before, there is a case to be made 
that we have not seen the bottom and we may retest that June low because uh, things are coming back quickly and inflation is not really slowing down as fast as, uh, as we would like. But, uh, you know, that, that, that is a debate that is going to continue for the rest of the year. Krishna, can I squeeze one in on high yield credit? I caught up with your friend Bob Michael over at JP Morgan Asset Management yesterday on this program right about 24 hours ago. He was bullish, more constructive on high yield in the last couple of months when spreads had gapped out to about 580 basis points. Where they are right now, not really interested. He thinks next year we can get back out maybe towards the kind of levels of 650 towards 700. How are you thinking about high yield credit, Krishna, into next year? Well, so uh, I'm glad uh, uh, Bob has changed his position a little bit because that's not what he was saying the last time I was with, the, with him on the say, this, this very show. Uh, the, the, the point is, if, if the data is going to turn down and turn down hard, uh, we, we can make a case that uh, we have probably seen the bottom. I don't think that is the case. I think there's still a great deal of strength in the underlying economy and the inflationary pressures remain in place. That sort of keeps the Fed uh, in the current path. Uh, and and uh, there is an equal uh, likelihood that they may get to, uh, it's not just as much about terminal rate as to how long do they stay at that terminal rate. And uh, I, I think there's I a case to be made that, that, may be, uh, that may be a little bit more tenuous than what the high yield market is expecting right now. Couldn't agree more. Krishna, thank you, sir. Krishna Mamali of Lafayette College. That's what Jan Hassius was saying. Yeah, exactly. 3.5, you get there, but maybe you hold it for how long? Two years. For two years. Two years. And how much does that really change where the market is right now? Because they're looking for the opposite. Mike McKee, can we talk about QT just briefly? Well, yeah. we have all these Fed presidents lined up in this seat tomorrow. In about 60 seconds, tell us how important this QT discussion has to be. It's going to be less important to the Fed than it is to the markets because nobody knows at the Fed. You ask them what impact it's going to have on rates and they say there's no way to know and so they're going to let it play out and then react to that if it, are they if, if they yeah if they tight well i mean if it, if it starts to tighten credit too much then they can back off on the rate side or vice versa but they can't go into it knowing what's going to happen and they can't tell you what's going to happen because this is only the second can time they we've tell done us it anything about interest rates without a deep understanding of what a $1 trillion reduction in the balance sheet is going to do to financial conditions. Uncharted territory, and that's what the whole theme of this meeting is all about. Mike McKee, John. looking forward to the coverage that you'll be leading with Kathleen Hayes through the next 24 <laughs> hours or so. I can tell you, TK sighting I know. out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> He's looking. He's loitering. Yeah. I'm not sure what's going on here. <laughs> yeah. Megan Green's going to be joining us shortly as well from the Kroll Institute. Looking forward to that. Live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming this morning. <laughs> He's talking. Good morning. <laughs> I have no idea if you can hear what's going on. years of excessive monetary policy uh, has, you know, made the average investor sort of complacent. I don't think that the market is adequately pricing in quantitative tightening. Increasing concern, I think, about the cumulative impact of, of the tightening cycle. Liquidity withdrawal um, from quantitative lightning that we've tightening that we've never experienced before. New and unpleasant reality here. I'm looking now at credit spreads in the mid 400s um, and, and they just look too expensive to me. Maybe markets got excited about a Fed pivot. What would it be that would cause them to pause rate hikes? This time they're not going to, unless something really bad happens. Live from Jackson, what whole what I mean this morning. Good morning. Do you know why I became a news anchor? Yeah, because right. I couldn't do this. Oh yeah. <laughs> my, first, my, my first job yeah, was on the studio floor. floor. The my my yeah, first been, job was on the studio been... floor, and I was absolutely shocking at it. And I think I lasted two weeks. And they were like, <laughs> "Get into the newsroom. Yeah. Just get into the newsroom yeah. and stay away from us." What a tremendous effort to take us inside and then bring us outside and have us all around in the one table games. together again. Tom. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're here, and, and you know, it, it's going to be exciting to get through this Thursday and onto a far more important Friday. But it's also about taking in the why they're here. They're academic papers. They're like watching paint dry. The only one that reads all of them is Michael McKee. <laughs> Nobody else reads them. He sits there with a pencil and goes to all, all of them like this. And then there's the other stuff, which is the conversation. And to me, John, the international conversation of a U.S. doing better 
is front and center off of claims this morning. And when you see Esther George a little bit later, are you going to tell her that this event sometimes is like watching paint dry? Yeah, I told her that last that? night. <laughs> How did that work she out? threw a drink in my face. <laughs> Chairman Powell tomorrow. We'll hear from him at 8 a.m. local time, so that's 10 a.m. Eastern time. And Lisa, the market, as you know, has got a lot of questions. Yeah, especially because right now they're not buying what the Fed is selling. The Fed is trying to sell them that they're trying to fight and tighten financial conditions, and the market's saying, nah, we don't buy it. Futures this morning, Tom, positive about four tenths mm. of one yeah, percent. Yeah, to my point. There's a little bit of a move, and you know the yield move. It wasn't much off the economic the data. The data points here. I've seen two moves. And two jackrabbits just went by, okay. and they haven't lost their horns yet, John, which is great. I can see a Megan Green alongside you as well. <laughs> okay. Yes, and she's furrowing her brow. What did I get myself into? <laughs> Global Ch Chief Economist at the Kroll Institute joins us right now. Megan, what are you expecting over the next couple of days? Uh, so I think Chair Powell is going to say that the Fed's really serious about inflation, that they're going to have to raise it enough to bring uh, rates enough to bring inflation down. Yep. I think. He's not going to say that they don't know exactly how high that's going to be, but there's a lot of data to come out still before the September meeting. So I think that's why markets are perfectly straddling a 50 basis point hike and a 75 basis point hike. There's just too much that we don't know. And the economic data has been really confusing, um, even for mm -hmm. economists, right? The soft data is all pretty terrible. The hard data is pretty good, though, so it suggests that a recession's a ways off, but we'll see whether, you know, the hard data catches up with confidence fairies or the other way around. Megan, you own the franchise of the transatlantic. You've been on both sides academically and also in your professional career. I looked at two Bloomberg financial conditions indexes yesterday. Mm -hmm. I went back 30 years, and the word is never. We have never seen a financial conditions partition like a Europe at war and the United States doing better. How important is that to the Powell discussion? I think it's I think it's more important for the ECB actually than it is for the U.S. because the biggest implications are really in terms of FX. That's why you've seen the euro go through parity, and I think we'll see it sink lower. So you know, I, I think the U.S. is kind of the gorilla in the room. The Fed is the world's central bank. Um, and, and dollar moves affect the U.S. economy, but not massively. I think the bigger implications are for Europe. So right now it sounds like everyone's saying there's not much that Fed Chair Jay Powell can say tomorrow that's clearly going to change anything. And yet the market seems to be gearing up for a really big change and everything is moving in tandem. What could they do to redefine the narrative, to take hold of the intellectual leadership at a time when that has been the main criticism of the Fed, that they have been behind and they've been wishy-washy? So they can only do what they have been doing for several months now, which is to say, okay, we get it, inflation's staying high, uh, and, and we're really serious about it. I mean, we, I think we have seen peak inflation, so to some degree, I think the Fed's job should get a little bit easier um, on that basis. But I, I think all that the Fed and all that Chair Powell really can do is to highlight, you know, hawkishly that they're really serious about inflation, and they're not going to pivot um, so that, you know, market pricing of rate cuts already at the beginning of next year are probably off the mark. You think that's ridiculous, don't you, that we're talking about rate cuts already? I do, even though the economic data hasn't been fantastic, right? I, I like many economists, have been calling for a recession next year, but I, I don't think that the Fed's going to be cutting rates at the beginning of next year. 8.5 CPI now. What are you thinking that comes down to by year end? By the end of this year, yeah. uh, you know, I think it, it'll be great if it were down by 6%. But I also think that the trajectory is more important than the actual level. I think the Fed would be pretty happy with 3 or 4% inflation if the trajectory were really clear. And I think we should start to see the trajectory improve. Well, the tra trajectory is part of it. i got all these T words, transitory trajectory. It, to, our, to Karsten's brilliant interview with Chris Giles today in the FT, is there a theory here? Because Karsten's is adamant. The Phillips curve is really difficult right now. Is all this mumbo jumbo here, are we making it up as we go, or is there an underlying theory you can glean at Jackson Hole? I don't glean it. Yeah, no, look, the world's never been through this before. We've never yes, put the, the world on ice, the global economy on ice, and then defrosted it. Uh, and so I think we are flying blind to a certain degree. <laughs> we have theories that kind of underpin it. I don't think it's the Phillips curve. I don't okay, think the Phillips curve so really holds up. You're, you're okay? <laughs> okay. What's going on with you? I just had to sneeze. It's very awkward. It's very She's awkward to sneeze on She's never been in air this clean. <laughs> I, I just got a message from a Bloomberg <laughs> subscriber. Someone alert Megan to the bear disguised as Inspector Cluso next to her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She's in danger, I'm told. Megan Green, thank you. No, 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 thank you. We're not done. We are. I think no, we're not done. You're Megan, one very Inspector quickly Clouseau, here. Not the me. Red Sox are a train wreck. <laughs> what do they need to do to begin to rebuild for next year? Oh, God. Uh, they need to deepen their pitching bench, I think, more than anything else. A lot of injuries. Else. Yeah, that's right. How do they get healthy? 
I think that would help a lot. But okay. Now we can end the conversation. Yeah. yeah. Now we can end. Yeah, Tom was brought out here to say it's like watching paint dry. They're not going to say anything. It's mumbo jumbo. jumbo. Let's talk about the Red Sox. I, I think jumbo. theory is is distant here. I think it, they're to a huge extent going from data point to data point. Making it up. I have to say, go. Tom, so is this market. <laughs> the, the narrative seems to change from one data point to the next, Megan. This is why we're giving we're up on forward you. guidance. <laughs> this is why we're giving up on forward guidance. It we just depends yes. on the data. Stuff. We can't come up with a theory yeah, but, in advance. But then, what is all of the discussion? And why are so many Fed officials coming out and trying to give us guidance? Yeah, because they're trying to give everyone a sense of how they're thinking about things so that as there are developments, there won't be big surprises yeah. on how they'll respond to them. Um, but the data's, you know, all over the place. So, so Megan's it's difficult point, to come up with a Their a job real now theory. is to establish clearly what their reaction function is. That's what we need a better understanding of. If yeah. unemployment's going to start climbing at year end and inflation's still at six, like yeah. you indicated, <laughs> Megan, what do they do? How high is the hurdle for a pause? Never mind a cut. And how much cohesion is there among Fed officials on what that reaction they do what is Hatsi right now? has said. Time is their friend. They just delay all the market structure that says lower rates, cutting rates, all this. I'm other still trying to adjust to Neil Kashkari, the new hawk on FMC. <laughs> yeah, and then What's Esther George. The or Esther dub. George, the new dub, exactly. Yeah, new reversal. Savita Subramaniam is going to be joining us very shortly of Bank of America with equity futures up four tenths on the S and P. Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> Live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming I this morning. Good morning. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Don't you think we need that soothing Jackson Hole music to go with this backdrop? We do. I, I, you know, just, you know, that 1955. I thought it worked out. What about the opening well? bell? That, the opening bell that works too. That doesn't really work with the season. Equity music. futures got into the opening <laughs> bell, negative about four tenths of one percent on the S and P 500. First print on the Dow up 100 points. There we go. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thanks That's for that. That's an original moment for this use. program. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let me tell you, that doesn't often get a quote. 32,972. Okay. America's index Are is green on the screen. Are you trolling me on my own program? Exactly. Is what that it what is. you're doing? I am. I'm looking for elk, and I saw two jackrabbits. So we're having a good morning. Unbelievable. Yeah. We're falling out over this. The Dow. The yields, Dow. Yields. Bond yields in, down. Three basis points on a two-year, 336. Taylor Riggs has some of the opening bell market action. Hey, Taylor. No doubt here, John. Only fundamentals for you. Take a look at NVIDIA. Of course, some of the quarterly results coming up yesterday after the closing bell. We did a whole full 30 minutes on still some of the chip makers that are showing signs of struggling. And you certainly see that just a little bit with NVIDIA, of course, this morning. Third quarter revenue, a billion dollars short of estimates and about two and a half billion dollars short of where the estimates on the street were just a few weeks ago second quarter gaming revenue also down about 33 percent take a look at shares of peloton as well another seventh miss in nine quarters erasing some of the big gains that we had <laughs> yesterday on the amazon news that they're going to be selling some of their bikes there so mkm partners <laughs> coming out and calling it this morning just another uh, sort of big down miss here for this company Snowflake big to the upside, John. You're up 19%. This is a $50 billion cloud data software company. Of course, second quarter product revenue up 83%. Alibaba, I'll finish it here for you. You're up almost 4% or so. You're looking at the mainland government, looking at maybe a 19-point stimulus plan. China big tech on the rise today, John. Hey, Taylor, thank you. If you're just tuning in on TV and radio worldwide, we are in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, for some special coverage for you of the Fed's annual get-together. We'll hear from Chairman Powell tomorrow morning at 8 local, about 10 a.m. Eastern time. Tom, something has crept back into the conversation in this market. Crude, Brent, 102. This 102. is a story not being talked about, and I think what's so important here is the bulls were vanquished. There was a hue, and we were in London last. And you weren't there. It was, it was with Lisa. We were in London, and J.P. Morgan was adamant about the structure, 120, 150. They were vanquished by the bears, who sort of got what they wanted. I mean, Ed Morrison Company. For a moment. For a heartbeat. 90. And all of a sudden, we're, uh, I'm sorry, we're up $15. How much does this gain some of the uh, momentum heading into September, October, when the Strategic Petroleum Reserve stops? And it's important releasing. here is Francisco Blanche of Bank that, of yeah. yeah, Francisco Blanche of Bank of America was adamant about the complexity of the moment in commodities. What do we have? 70 straight days of gasoline prices. 71. Petrol coming down. 
<laughs> and then picking up again a little recently. Dig. It's yeah. not a dig, I'm joking. <laughs> Bank of America, Savita Subramaniam joins us now. And Savita, fantastic to have you with us. I wanted to start with a note that you actually put out a number of weeks ago. And the title was something like, why are we so happy with 8.5% CPI? <laughs> Savita, why was this market so happy with 8.5% CPI? Look, I think that part of it was the idea that we're off peak. But our point was, sometimes the second derivative doesn't matter. Sometimes it's the first derivative you want to pay attention to. And 8.5% CPI is really far away from 2 or 3%, which is what we believe the market is pricing in. Um, I think that, you know, when I hear the bullish arguments for, you know, kind of justification for the rally that we've seen from July, uh, or, you know, from June, I guess, um, it's, it's two things. It's one, we've moved past peak inflation, and, but wages are still strong, so the consumer is still going to be okay, therefore soft landing. That's one bullish argument that I disagree with. And the second bullish argument that I disagree with is that we've seen earnings better than feared. We've seen results better than feared. And everybody points to really strong top line and um, you know 15% sales growth for the S&P. The problem with that is that most of the work for sales was coming from energy. Energy grew sales by 80%. Everything else was fairly lackluster. And then when you adjust for inflation, when you take that 9% print of inflation out of 2Q sales, the sales for the S&P 500 X energy were essentially flat. More companies in the S&P 500 undershot inflation in sales, couldn't grow sales faster than pricing, which is really, a, you know, kind of a weird setup um, versus the other half that managed to beat, beat uh, CPI. So I think that what we're, point, what we're all looking for are reasons to get more bullish, but the reasons are pretty thin, if you ask me. Um, on peak CPI and strong, still strong job costs, I mean, I see that as, as still strong labor, I see, I see that as um, overwhelmingly negative because what that means is pricing power for the average corporation is starting to wane, demand is starting to wane, but wages, which are the, the biggest depressant on corporate margins for the S&P 500, are sticky and high. I mean, why are we celebrating about this? I just don't get it. And that was the essence of your note, Savita. We caught up with Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley yesterday, who's very much on the same page as you at the moment on some of these issues. Take a listen to what he had to say. The old fire and ice narrative is coming back into play. We're in a downtrend. And until the market can get back above that downtrend, I think to be making some you know, grandiose call about new highs is, is quite frankly, it's irresponsible given what's going on with the Fed and QT coming as Bob laid out. It's going to be a lot worse than people... Uh, have experienced so far. Price is wrong and the earnings are wrong again, which means the uh, attractiveness, the risk reward today could be almost as bad as it was back in January. Savita, you're back at 3,600 on the S&P 500. That's your forecast. What's the Fed's role in that move lower that you're looking for? Look, I don't think the short end of the curve and what the Fed's doing at the short end matter as much as the long end. And I think that What's bizarre to me is that, you know, I think this laser focus on, you know, sort of inflation prints and on a monthly basis and real time reads on inflation. And what is the Fed going to do? Are they going to hike 50 basis points or 25? You know, are they going to start cutting? I think all of that is second to what happens at the long end of the curve. And, you know, I like that 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 phrase complexity of the moment, because I think this is a very complex moment for equities. And the reason I say that is the duration of the S&P 500 is still above 30 years. We're looking at a 30-year zero-coupon bond. So what that means is that a mere 50 basis point change in the cost of equity capital, which is more influenced by the long end, could drive the market either really high or really low from here. Right. And I think that's what makes up the complexity of the moment for equities. Savita, Brian Moynihan takes immense pride in studying the granularity of American business. It is the franchise of your Bank of America. What are you in the sell side at Bank of America, the research analysts, what are they saying about how corporations are adapting and adjusting to these complexities? Well, you know, you're right. So corporations are adapting and adjusting, and it's really marvelous to watch. Uh, but I think that what that requires is a fair amount of capital spending from the big multinationals that are in the process of 
you know, rejiggering supply chains with supply chains, which is a complicated and long process that costs a lot of money. Um, they're also in the process of automating labor, which has gotten that much more expensive. So this is all really good for long term productivity of corporations. We haven't seen a real capex cycle in a long time because earnings have been void by low rates, buybacks, all sorts of machinations that aren't real economic growth. But I think what we're seeing now is the beginnings of a real, you know, a real growth cycle driven by companies getting more productive. And that is very bullish for the S&P 500. Unfortunately, I think it takes a little while to get there. And it also costs a lot in terms of capital spending. So what we like within the market are the more domestic plays that could benefit from that CapEx cycle. And yeah. Jill Hall, our SMID strategist, has been talking about this, um, you know, on your show uh, quite a bit. So I think that's a great area to start to deploy capital, but multinationals for the time being. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think multinationals. Well, no, it's, though, it's bullish well, talk. It's bullish talk from Savita. Well, hold on a second, Savita. This is actually exactly where I wanted to go because basically everyone's calling me a bear and dressing me up as one on the internet. But I am wondering from your perspective. Excuse me, not yet. Well, there was a bear it's head. Like a, like a mean thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like Which is okay. I, I accept it. I embrace it. That I, happens I, to me I'm not as scared well. of it. Um, yeah. I, I will just say that there is it's this sort of bullish money. tilt. There, there is no. I, I, I embrace tilt. it. <laughs> but if you, you know, what is the after 3,600, right? This is the distinction between the long term bulls and the long term bears, right? 3,600, is that the new low that is catharsis that then leads to adjusting and adapting of Tom Keene? Or is this a more protracted loss in the momentum and, frankly, the valuation of U.S. equities? Look, I think this is all happening at a warp speed. So at the beginning of the year, our long-term model was pointing to negative returns for the next 10 years. Today, the good news is that after this massive drop in the market and lower, not low, but lower multiples, that model is spitting out, you know, mid single digit returns for the S&P 500 for the next 10 years. That's a much better setup, a much better entry point. I do think that point in, ter point in time targets are fraught with all sorts of problems. But I will tell you this, I think that the fact that just a mere 50 basis point change in the cost of equity capital, either long rates or the risk premium, could drive us to yeah. our target of 3,600 makes yeah. me worried about the downside risk. Yeah. Savit, I got a key question is for all of Global Wall Street. They know you own the high ground on ESG investing. Essentially, you invented it. Is ESG <laughs> investing dead? Where is it in a year? I'm serious. Where is it in a year? Well, you know, I think what the problem right now is that investors are throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And we've done a lot of great work on, you know, and we've talked about our work on your show. ESG investing is nuanced. It's not one size fits all. Different sectors have different factors that are more important for driving. Uh, you know, social factors are more uh, important for labor intensive innovators, uh, environmental factors are more important for uh, energy and materials. So it's not just some kind of, you know, one size fits all, apply this rating to your entire portfolio and you're done. But we do think that there are a lot of ESG considerations that are being ignored in this, uh, you know, kind of refusal to even yeah. think about ESG in an environment where it's yeah. drawing a lot of fire. Um, so I think it's a it's a complex, nuanced topic, yeah. but I still think that there are lots of ways to make money. John, this is a huge deal. I, mean, I agree with you. She I remember invested catching a lot up, of time. I remember time catching up with Savisa and you. Was it in Davos? How many years ago was that? Uh, well, it, three it years was ago? three, four years ago. Something like that. Big she and Brian Moynihan said, we're going to actually do the math of ESG, and that's where they provided leadership. Who would have thought we'd be talking about coal? All over again in 2020. Exactly. Yeah. And talking about burning wood uh, yeah. in parts of Europe as well. Well, yeah. let's revisit this this morning. We, we failed at this today because of all the weather issues here and our great team. The real story this morning is Netherlands net gas broke out to new Up highs. Again. Breaking Maybe out you again. covered it when I was inside. In we did. Taking my siesta. When we were sitting next to you, you were listening. <laughs> <laughs> which is <laughs> just not an original moment. In fact, I remember it quite clearly. I think I was speaking to Tom at the time about you being gay anyway. Savita, you're going to be sticking with us, I'm pleased to say. Savita, oh, I didn't know that. Wonderful. I'm pleased to say that, Savita, we listen to you. Uh, do you listen to your guests ever? No. What about your co-anchors? No. Even less. Okay. <laughs>
Good. Look, I, I just want to tell you, I, 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 Benoit Carré, uh, the great French economist, emailed in, and one of his colleagues, this is years ago at French Tussauds, the economist Clouseau, he, 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 said, he said, for Jerome Powell, is this bearish? is a shoot, shoot, bang, bang, fed. A shoot, shoot, bang, it's bang, a, fed. I can't do the exit. The shoot, shoot, bang, bang, you fed. Do, you know the beauty of you, Tom, is that you just said the economist Clouseau and <laughs> someone out there, someone out there thought, up. where does he teach? Yeah, yeah. Where does he teach? Yeah, exactly. Where's he, he, where's he to go Toulouse. with the fisherian? Where's he? Where's okay. Rocher? Jean-Paul Rocher. down to Chapman House Fish <laughs> at 10 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow from the beautiful Jackson Hole, Wyoming. This is Bloomberg. An entire generation is now saddled with unsustainable debt in exchange for an attempt, at least, at a college degree. The burden is so heavy that even if you graduate, you may not have access to the middle-class life that the college degree wants. An entire generation is now saddled with unsustainable debt in exchange for an attempt, at least, at a college degree. The burden is so heavy that even if you graduate, you may not have access to the middle-class life that the college degree once provided. The President of the United States fulfilling a campaign pledge in TK, a controversial one. Uh, that, I'd say, in the last day or so. Yeah, just not to waste a lot of time, Jason Furman with us tomorrow. I think he's on Team Biden, scathing in his critique. Jason Furman is on with us tomorrow. And yeah. Jason Furman, like Larry Summers, at times, Lisa, has been a bit of a headache for this administration. In particular, with the inflationary impulse of some of their stimulus, of some of their plans, and how much does this sort of feed into that on the margins, not significantly, but basically giving people more power I, to spend at a time where that's a problem. That argument to me is second tier to the top tier argument, which is they've started a process, and as Megan McArdle in the Washington Post says, once they get started, what's next? What's the next program after this? What about me? It's the okay. phrase you heard a lot. So, you know, one of the Abramowitz clan gets into something that costs 80,000 bucks a year, and you go, wait, the people five years before me got Tuition relief. Where's my tuition relief? As you say, Tom, the eighty thousand dollars a year, though, that's the heart of the problem, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm sitting here like, going, why are you, why this. are you pledging that to me? I, I mean, we so would all go to a same. I'm really sorry. We would all go to a same. We would all go to a Emily Wilkins joins us now from Washington D.C. Emily, how controversial is this one proving to be? So this one is even controversial within the Democratic Party. I mean, you've seen some lawmakers like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren come out and praise the Biden administration for it. But you've seen other groups, notably the NAACP, saying that this really did not go far enough. And then on your more moderate Democrats, we saw one, uh, Chris Pappas, he's a frontline Democrat. He's going to be running a very competitive race in November. And he said, look, this doesn't really address the main problem, which is that college tuition is too high and we need to find ways to bring that back down. So a lot of mixed response here, a lot of criticism from Republicans. At the same point, what Biden seemed to really do here was kind of choose that middle ground. He didn't go as far as Warren initially pitched on the campaign trail with $50,000 of relief. He went for a smaller number. He limited it to those uh, who make less than $125,000 a year. Right. And he tried to really focus it on, on low-income students uh, on, offering Emily. those with Pell Grants. Emily, Emily, go Spartans on us here. What is the distinction between University of Chicago at 81,000 all in and Michigan State at a number that's a little bit beneath that? Who, how are those two schools treated in this new legislation? Well, to a certain extent, if you see schools, there's an argument out there that if schools see that the government is willing to forgive student loans, that doesn't really incentivize colleges to try and keep their tuition prices low. And let's also point out, I haven't heard this in the discussion too much, but the federal government has already forgiven hundreds and billions of dollars of student loans through numbers of other forgiveness programs. They've had their public service loan forgiveness. <laughs> They've had other programs where after you pay a certain month for a certain amount of time, you get the rest forgiven. 
given. So Americans have already been footing the bill for a lot of folks who have gone to college and racked up a lot of student debt through these other federal government programs. And you'll hear folks, particularly on, on the right, but even some on the left, say that they're concerned that some of this government aid that's been going out there, it really has not incentivized colleges to try and figure out ways to keep tuition low. And so we're going to see folks yeah. increasingly saddled with more and more debt. And then the question becomes, do you start seeing things like Biden's move yesterday become more common? Yeah, Emily Milkins of Bloomberg Government, thank you so much for being with us. The underlying question here really has become also, though, how protracted is the inflationary impulse if you start to get increasing numbers of programs that do aim at increasing the spending power of a whole swath of individuals, which brings us to the Jan Hatzias call. Savita Subramanian of Bank of America is still back with us. What is your view of the ramifications for equities if the Fed were to hold rates at 4%, 3.5%, for years in the face of some of these structural changes fueled by fiscal policy? You know, I think that that is, that is essentially what the market is pricing in. I mean, my view here is that, you know, what we're seeing now is actually a healthy, although, you know, somewhat volatile uh, return to normalcy. I mean, I, I thought that, you know, by the end of June, we had positive real rates, and then they retraced quickly back to zero. So I think part of what we're seeing is, a move towards a rational market with a rational discount rate. Um, you know, holding rates fixed, I think is, um, I mean, I, I just think that, that we need to let some of the, um, the, the, the leverage grow more expensive in order to shake out, you know, kind of excessive spending, excessive leverage levels, which, you know, fortunately aren't sitting on consumer or corporate balance sheets, but are sitting on government balance sheets. So, you know, I think the other argument that we hear around, you know, why we should be bullish is the idea that we have so much debt that the government can't afford to let rates move higher. I think that's actually a very bearish sign that we are in this, we've gotten ourselves into a, a, a box, basically, where we have to keep low, rates low forever in order to shoulder this burden of debt. Um, you know, I guess I, I look at a lot of the, the fiscal responses to this, and I think, you know, some of it's good. I mean, if you look at the green spend outlined in the Inflation Reduction Act, I think what that does is it shows corporations that they're not alone in getting to net zero and reducing their emissions and that the government is going to help along the way. But I also think that this pulls forward a lot of CapEx spending that uh, that companies were planning to do over a longer time horizon. Now they're going to pull it forward into the next five years. So, you know, if you think about it, the easiest way to get to lower emissions is by moving your operations closer to your consumer. And that's what we're seeing most companies do. In fact, our analysts our analyst base asked our companies, how are you going to reduce emissions? And one of the most frequent responses was reshoring, nearshoring. So, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, I think, is really interesting in that it does encourage moving to that, that goal faster. But what it might also do is push inflation up as companies spend more aggressively on CapEx uh, as this, this tax benefit, uh, you know, basically lasts for about five years. So, I, you know, it's, it's complicated. Hey, I don't know if keeping rates there, low though. forever is the answer. Thank you. Thanks. It's certainly not. Savita, thank you. John Taylor would thank say you. no. Savita Subramanian. I think John Taylor's saying no, isn't he? He, no he was people. really... He, it's amazing how many people are coming around to some form of not so much the shadow uh, days of, of your Charles Plosser and the rest, but to what John Taylor's saying is we need to right they the system. They were proper horse. Can you imagine if Charlie Plosser and... Richard they Fisher were proper was still hooks. here. Can well, you imagine Krugman's, where they, where they'd like phrase, rates to be? I give Krugman credit for this. I may be wrong on this. The inflationistas, what do they do in a time of 8.8% inflation? We're there. We're there right now, 8.5%. Yeah. yeah, well, at what point does everybody have to become an inflationista? Yeah. And would they have gotten ahead of it, right? Would they have been more right. aggressive about pushing the hand a little the, earlier? The beauty here, the elk in the distance, and there's two moose way, way over there. I can barely see I can tell you're distracted. A flight of yellow-thumped warblers just went right by. And it's, it's become, it'll be beautiful here tomorrow. Okay, are you going hiking today? I am. Okay, I got up cool. 6,000 feet. I'm trying to get up to 8,000 feet. Oh, today. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you enjoy. You enjoy. Inspector Cluso, going on a hike a little bit later. Economist Cluso. I'm going to take Bramo for breakfast. <laughs> Live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Grill.
Looking forward to the coverage continuing through today with Kathleen Hayes and Michael McKee. This is Bloomberg.